help you kick off a successful year. From navigating the social scene to the great debate, is your child ready for a phone? We'll also have an important lesson on how to stay safe on campus, especially if your student is away from home for the first time. In just a few minutes, we'll talk to Dr. Sue Varma on dealing with the anxiety of returning to school. But first, school safety is on the minds of many. We looked into some of the most effective measures. We aren't going to give away any secrets that could put your kids in danger, but we will show you some of the safety tactics used in schools today to potentially save lives. Nearly 50 million kids in the U.S. are headed back to class, and across the country, districts are approaching security differently. In Indiana, Jay County schools have gun safes on each campus, where trained staff have access with just a thumbprint. Clinton Public Schools in Mississippi added a fourth police officer, and in Las Vegas, El Dorado High School is set for a $26 million security upgrade with cameras, single point entry, and perimeter fencing. I'm here at White Plains High School in New York for an exclusive look at their campus security system. And with me is John LaPlaca. He's a consultant who works with schools across the nation. Let's talk about the security here. What's the first thing a visitor would notice? So as we approach the building, we're going to have a single locked point of entry for visitors. Uh, if they want to gain access to the building, the first step in the process would be they'd buzz in on the intercom system, which would be answered by security personnel inside. Hi there, it's John LaPlaca from Altaris. I'm here to visit the main office. So I've announced myself, and the security person has now given us access to the building as buzzed us into the vestibule. But that's not it. We're stopped by a second set of doors where security scans our driver's license to cross-check against the sex offender registry and local banned persons lists. Okay, John, so now we're inside the school. What other security measures are in place here? So visible throughout the building, you'll see cameras. It also gives law enforcement the ability in an emergency situation to look at the cameras. What about the classrooms themselves? They have electronic locks, which will actually automatically lock in an emergency situation. Some of the best returns on investment for safety and security are things that cost nothing at all. Low-cost signs to help people provide 911 with their location and help responders outside find them. Oh, okay. Okay. We took part in an actual lockdown drill where teachers served as students. Assistant Principal Guy Vitiello, wearing this bright orange shirt, serves as a trespasser on campus. I'm in the classroom with teacher Daniel Furry, who shows us what happens when someone triggers the alarm. I'm going to activate the call. Okay. Students get to the safe zone. Students get to the safe zone. So you instruct your students to go back to the safe zone? Lockdown. Lockdown. Lock the doors. Stay away from the windows. Across campus, the alert can be seen and heard from these LED boxes. Furry is trained to quickly scan for nearby students before securing the room. So you go outside and make sure that there are no students in the hallway or you grab them to get into the safe zone? Correct. Okay. Come in, come in, get into the safe zone in the corner there. Lockdown. Go in the room. In an actual lockdown, only law enforcement can enter the building. Today, school resource officers from White Plains PD enter through a back door closest to our trespasser. Now, when you close that door, Mr. Furry, does it lock automatically? It lock automatically. Police didn't want to reveal their tactical response, but told us the priority is to go straight to the trespasser and confront the security risk. The White Plains Police, can you tell us why you're in the building? Inside, everyone remains in lockdown. Only police can unlock the doors and let them out. As you stand here in the corner, what kind of goes through your mind? Thinking about the students, you know, and what, how they're feeling and how important it is to reassure them that when they're here, they're safe, that we have systems for them to ensure their safety and their comfort and then reassuring them afterwards. White Plains Police Chief Joe Costelli says his department holds multiple training drills like this every year. These are decisions officers have to make in a split second. How important is training to that muscle memory? The more we do it, the more um, we will react in a crisis situation, a high-stress situation. Okay. The time to train is not the time when the crisis is going on. The chief says everyone in the community can make the difference. See something, say something. Look, we want to help anybody who may be in distress. Superintendent Joe Ricca says planning, practice, and communication is the critical first layer of security to keeping any campus safe. At the core of any strong security plan is always going to be the training, training, training. And joining me now is board certified psychiatrist Dr. Sue Varma to help us ease into the school year and eliminate some of the anxiety that comes with a new year. Welcome Dr. Varma, thanks for being here. Thank you. Help us understand what are some of the conversations that we parents can have with our kids to ease some of their worries. 
So, you know, school safety is number one on everyone's mind. And the child may say, like, how can I how can I feel safe with all that's happening in the world? And I think it's really important for parents to have age appropriate conversations, depending on the kid, you may want to keep it very simple if we're talking about five to seven year olds. Um, and older kids may want a little bit more information. But really having open ended questions where you leave it to them to say, what are you worried about? Mm -hmm. So we're not projecting our fears and anxieties onto them. And then providing some le level of support and reassurance to say it's going to be okay we'll figure this out because really that's what kids want to hear at the end of the day that it's all going to be okay what are some action statements that we can use if a kid says you know I'm kind of worried about my safety at school yes what is something you can tell them that's concrete yes so I would say listen like let's have a safety plan you know I know that the, the idea of kids having cell phones is a big topic and maybe we can talk about that another day but you know if the kid is age appropriate like somewhere between 9 10 11 like I want to give my kids phones like as right nearing that age so say that you can contact me when you're in school if you you don't feel safe if the school allows for it or for example if you're going to like an event and you're at a parade to say if we got um, separated at the parade where's the meeting point what is your address do you know your phone number because a lot of young kids don't know or can you look for like a familiar face in the parade or the event that you're going to so having very concrete tips and to say yeah. I'm going to the PTA meeting I'm going to find out at school what is the plan the yes. safety plan and we're going to get our local legislators involved we'll get the local police department involved so giving them some structure and confidence that you've got things figured out or you're going to figure them out with them. That makes sense. And giving them actual things to do and giving them knowledge, you know, information that you gather. Yes. That's super helpful. What are some of the other back to school anxieties that kids have? Because it's been a summer and maybe they're worried about their friends or just a new teacher, a new school. Yes. All of that. All of the above. Like you said, you know, one thing is separation anxiety. Young mm -hmm. kids are going to feel like I've spent the whole summer with you and now we're not going to be together. I know the older kids, the teens and tweens may be like, I'm happy to peace out. Right. <laughs> right. So the younger kids um, that separation if you can create a few moments in the in the morning to mm -hmm. say listen we're gonna have everything ready we'll have their lunches packed let's just watch some videos for a couple of minutes let's laugh let's like watch something on YouTube or TikTok whatever feels family friendly to you mm -hmm. um, the other anxieties are fitting in body image mm -hmm. issues are a big deal nowadays yeah. as young people are on social media and feeling Especially like they're not for young girls absolutely not living up to standards so finding them activities that make them feel body confident mm -hmm. sports are a great way getting keeping kids active throughout the summer so that they feel a sense of agency over their body finding them clothes that fit if that's an issue peer pressure and like discussing a lot of this and recognizing that it's going to be evolving in real time but keeping the door open keeping interested asking them questions what are you watching what are you doing what are you worried about those that's all such great actionable advice dr. Subarma as always we appreciate your time thank you thank you all right well we talked about it there the great debate coming up is your child ready for a phone plus we'll look at the other gadgets your kids may need which include laptops that are right for your family Later, College Safety 101, the do's and don'ts of college life. Consumer Confidential, coming right back. These days, it feels like the news never stops. So let's get into it. What's happening right now, what it all means for you for an hour every day. It can be hard to keep up, so let's get started together. Hallie Jackson now, weekdays at 5 on NBC News Now. To cover the news, you have to be in it. This is how so many towns and cities are protecting themselves. They're pushing the gates open. Was there a school officer on campus? That's what we've been told. No, top story with Tom Hamas. Weeknights at 7 on NBC News Now. These days, it feels like the news never stops. So let's get into it. What's happening right now, what it all means for you for an hour every day. It can be hard to keep up, so let's get started together. Hallie Jackson Now, weekdays at 5 on NBC News Now. To cover the news, you have to be in it. This is how so many towns and cities are protecting themselves. They're pushing the gates open. Was there a school officer on campus? That's what we've been told. No, top story with Tom Yamas. Weeknights at 7 on NBC News Now. The day's biggest political stories with trusted insight now and expert analysis now. A daily look at the politics behind the headlines. Meet the press now. Streaming weekdays at 4 p.m. on NBC News Now. For breaking news in our changing world, download the NBC News app. Hallie Jackson now, weekdays at 5 on NBC News Now. These days, it's known as the great debate. When are kids ready to have a phone? Parents want to be able to stay in touch with their children throughout the day, but owning a phone can open up a different set of headaches. Here's NBC's Kate Snow.
The pandemic changed everything, including the way kids learned and spent their free time. According to Common Sense Media, screen use for teens and tweens has grown by 17% since 2019, with kids 8 to 12 clocking five and a half hours a day, and 13 to 18-year-olds logging nearly nine hours a day on devices. Now many parents are pumping the brakes. For mom of four, Adriana Stacy, the family policy has always been firm. We don't buy smartphones for our children. She's a psychiatrist who's seen the effects of increased screen time in her practice. I'll get a patient in my office, usually a teenager, who all of a sudden started to really struggle with anxiety and depression. Pretty much every time we can trace that back to when did you get a phone? But her oldest, Annalise, a 10th grader, often feels left out. It's definitely hard sometimes because I have been like left out of decisions because I haven't been on a group chat or something. It's also been a struggle in the classroom. Some of Annalise's teachers ask students to use their smartphones to do classwork. We do feel like we're standing alone on an island. But the island is getting bigger. A movement called Wait Until 8th encourages parents to wait until at least 8th grade to give kids smartphones. The network is 40,000 families strong, and they've seen a 25% increase in participation in the last year alone. Parents have seen the impact of screens on kids over the past couple of years with online school and lots of social media consumption. Let's get our kids outside. Let's get our kids reading. Let's get our kids playing with other kids in real life. And let's let our kids enjoy being kids. Research about the impact of smartphones is mixed. A large study using data from the National Institutes of Health found screen time was moderately associated with worse mental health, increased behavior problems, decreased academic performance, and poorer sleep, but also found using a smartphone or device improved friendships and connection. Dr. Jean Twangy is a professor of psychology at San Diego State and author of the book iGen. Are we basically experimenting on our kids, not knowing what the impact of these smartphones will be long term? All of us are basically living in a big social experiment where smartphones have taken over. In effect, we're experimenting with their brains. Hey, let's give them all smartphone and see what happens. Experts agree if parents are going to allow smartphones, they should be banned from the bedroom overnight, and they recommend setting time limits and parental controls. And for the growing number of parents who decide not to give their kids a smartphone at all, talk to your kids about your concerns and consider a stripped-down phone for calls and texts only. Last year, Annalise Stacy got one of those. At 15 years old, she already sees the benefits of not having a smartphone. It's been a positive experience not growing up with one because I spent more time doing more valuable things and less time on my phone. I have better self-esteem and better social skills and I can definitely like communicate and just talk to people more. Kate Snow, NBC News, New York. In a recent study from the University of Texas, researchers gave people a series of tests without a smartphone near them and then with a smartphone near them. Just having that phone within reach, even though they weren't touching it, was enough of a distraction that the people didn't concentrate or do as well on their tests. So food for thought there. All right, so in addition to a phone, there is a lot of other technology that parents may want to consider. Mark Spoonauer, who is a tech expert and global editor-in-chief of Tom's Guide, is here with a look at back-to-school tech for every age. Mark, thanks for being here. Thanks for having me. All right, let's start with this. Parents who may not want to give kids a smartphone with all the bells and whistles yet, but they still want the safety and security of knowing they can get in touch with their kids, what are we looking at? So think of this as like a smartphone training wheels. Okay, right? I like so, it. So the first device is the GyoBit. Uh -huh. And the idea behind this device is being able to track your kids and know where they are. It's really light. It's 139, so fairly affordable. Okay. You can attach it to their backpack, their clothes. And the idea is that if your kid is coming home from school or, or leaving, you will get automatic notifications on your phone In based on location. Yes. Okay. Okay. And what about this guy right here, this little... Watch so this is kind of like the Dick Tracy watch is, <laughs> is making a comeback. So this is called the TikTok 4. Okay. It, it goes for 199 
And unlike the Apple Watch, there's actually, not only can you make phone calls through it, but there's a five megapixel camera built in. So you can have video calls with grandma or whoever you like. Oh, you wow. get to set the contacts. Okay. The other good thing about this watch is that with kids, a lot of people with, with screen time increasing, people are worried about, are my kids staying active? There's an activity tracker built in and oh. there's some gamification features so your kids will want to be active. Moving on to the next item, laptops, yeah. very pricey. What do we need to know about you know the best ones to get for our kids? Sure, so we do a lot of testing um, at Tom's Guide including battery life. And what we love about the new MacBook Air M2 in particular is that it lasts for 14 hours on a charge okay. where we just continuously surf the web. So it does really well in that regard. Mm -hmm. It's also very well built. And we think that students are going to like the new colors, including the blue model that you see here. Uh, the performance is great. And it has a high resolution full HD webcam built in because a lot of us are doing more video calls with parents at home, right. but even interacting with our professors. Okay. So let's yeah. move on quickly to the laptop sure. bag. Some of them actually have locks built in. Yeah. So this is uh, from Mancro, and it's only $26 on Amazon. Mm. And there's a couple of great features. One is that you can order one with a combination lock built in, which is really good mm -hmm. for protecting your laptop. The other thing that you see right here is that there's a, there's a USB cable. And if you want to, you can have it snaking outwards. And there's a USB port right here. So all you have to do is put in your own portable charger. So let's say you're at class and you're right. running low on juice. You can charge up your phone or your laptop using your backpack. Okay, I'm running out of time, but sure. let's talk about these trackers. Yeah. These are so important to keep track of all of your devices, right? Yeah. They're made by Apple and who else? So this is Tile mm -hmm. and Apple. And the best way to look at these trackers and to think about them is that one is for Apple and iPhone mm -hmm. and the other is for Android. Okay, right? very good. So <laughs> and then if you are a student riding a bike, got to get a helmet. Why is this one special? Uh, this is great because it has LEDs built in and it gives you full visibility when you're on the road and there's a remote control built in. So if you're riding your bike, uh -huh. you can actually let people know if you're about to turn left or right and you can control that with a remote control on the handlebar or using your Apple Watch. Okay, I'm going to challenge you real quick. <laughs> 10 seconds. What's this? Okay, so the Nest video doorbell is one of our favorites because it gives you a very tall aspect ratio. So not only can you see people, but packages that are at your door, which okay. is really great for college students. Mark Spoonauer, our tech expert. Thank you, Mark. <laughs> Thank you. Still to come, how to talk to kids about peer pressure. But first, College Safety 101. How to avoid becoming a target for criminals. Consumer Confidential is coming right back. The day's biggest political stories with trusted insight now and expert analysis now. A daily look at the politics behind the headlines. Meet the Press Now, streaming weekdays at 4 p.m. on NBC News Now. Now Tonight with Joshua Johnson, streaming weeknights at 8 on NBC News Now. News is happening now. Look at what's making headlines around the world. Right now on Morning News Now. We're coming on the air with breaking news. And this is a significant moment. Whenever it happens, wherever you are, NBC News, streaming free now. We'll meet Ukrainians who are defending their country one block at a time. You were still in Kiev. Could you hear the bombing? My name is Lester. Who is this? News is happening now. A look at what's making headlines around the world. We're coming on the air with breaking news. This is a significant moment. Whenever it happens, wherever you are, NBC News, streaming free now. Today is now a podcast, available every morning. Listen wherever you get your podcasts. Good evening from New Orleans. Nice to go really spend some time with you. Appreciate it. College is a special time for so many young adults, but that independence also comes with new risks. So how do you avoid being a target for criminals? I went back to school for a refresher course on campus safety. At college campuses across America, it's back to school. Each year, around 20 million U.S. students attend college. For some, it's the first time they're on their own, and safety may not be their first priority. 
Unfortunately, crime on college campuses has been on a steady decline for years. According to the most recent numbers in 2020, there were a reported 28,000 crimes. That's a record low, due in part to remote learning during the pandemic. But as we return to in-person classes, we're here on the campus of Fairleigh Dickinson University in New Jersey for an important lesson on how to stay safe while in school. Joining me is Mike Sapraconi. He has 16 years of experience as an NYPD detective and is now the president of global security firm Squad Security. Mike, we talk about safety all the time. What do we need to know about staying safe when it comes to being on a college campus? Being alert, paying attention, always being vigilant to what's around you, making sure you know your friends, they know where you're going, they have your telephone number, you have theirs. Always to be in touch with somebody. And being prepared is so important. Always being prepared. Let me introduce you to Treasure Thomas. Hi, Treasure, come on in. She's a junior here at Fairly, and she's going to take you through a day in the life of a student here on campus. Great. Uh, nice to meet you, Tracy. Nice Looking to, forward to it. Nice to meet you, too. Her day starts when she drives to class. Great place to park. You want to park where there's a light. So at night, you, have a, you know where your car is. You want to park otherwise places where there are other cars parked. And keep your key in your hand. Don't hit it 30 yards out because then someone's going to see that you're opening the doors. When you get close to your car, hit your fob, go in your door. And as soon as you get in the door, before you start your car, lock your door. Almost every school has campus-wide alerts, usually sent via text message. So what should I do if I get that alert? Well, if you're in a classroom, you should certainly be guided by your professor, your instructor. If not, you should definitely contact public safety or if you are your RA if you have some concerns. But you should have a point of contact that you should be able to go to. Another tip? Add the number for campus public safety in your phone. They can usually respond faster than 911. A big mistake students make at the library. You see you have your computer out, you probably have your phone out on the desk, and sometimes I'm sure you've gotten up to go do something and you've left them there. Of course. And it's a bad idea. Theft is the number one crime on campuses, okay? It's a crime of opportunity. While walking around, Mike says to use the buddy system, and if no one is available, call campus public safety. They usually will provide an escort. What if someone's making me uncomfortable and I'm nervous and I'm all by myself? That's important. A lot of people are afraid to say anything, but you should maybe change direction. Walk to where you might see more people and never be afraid to scream. Screaming is good. Screaming scares people, it alerts people. Emergency phone, uh, blue light box, so important on campuses to know where they are and to know how to use them. While touring the dorm, Mike immediately notices some security concerns, like this propped door, which Treasure says students do all the time. Anybody comes in the storm, that stuff is theirs. I mean, it's just so easy to take. We got to make it a little harder on them. This is great to have the sunlight come in on a beautiful day. But this can't be left like this. You're on the first floor. Good job here by locking the window. But you don't want everybody to have that easy access to see what's going on or what's in your room. Here's another thing. You have this mirror covering the peephole. It defeats the purpose of you being able to look out. At night, always use the buddy rule. Never accept drinks from strangers and wait until the next day to post on social media so no one can track your whereabouts. We covered a lot of stuff today. Good luck in school in this next semester and spread the word to all your friends. Thank you. Our thanks to Mike and Treasure for all those great tips. And Mike says the buddy system, it works best when you designate one person who will look for you if you don't come back to your dorm or you haven't checked in. All right, up next, dealing with tricky topics from drinking to consent. How to talk to kids about social pressure. You're watching Consumer Confidential on Today All Day. Allie Jackson Now, weekdays at 5 on NBC News Now. News is happening now. Look at what's making headlines around the world. Right now on Morning News Now. We're coming on the air with breaking news. And this is a significant moment. Whenever it happens, wherever you are, NBC News, streaming free now. For breaking news in our changing world, download the NBC News app. To cover the news, you have to be in it. This is how so many towns and cities are protecting themselves. They're pushing the gates open. Was there a school officer on campus? That's what we've been told. No, top story with Tom Yamas. Weeknights at 7 on NBC News Now. News is happening now. 
to look at what's making headlines around the world. We're coming on the air with breaking news. This is a significant moment. Whenever it happens, wherever you are, NBC News, streaming free now. Now tonight with Joshua Johnson, streaming weeknights at 8 on NBC News Now. Top Story with Tom Yamas, weeknights at 7 on NBC News Now. It's a topic parents can't afford to ignore, the social pressure and dangers your kids might face. In 2019, nearly a quarter of 14 and 15 year olds reported having at least one alcoholic drink. And data from the CDC suggests one in 12 high school students experiences physical dating violence. Joining us with important insight is Dr. Danielle Dooley, a general pediatrician and former Georgetown University Health Services worker. Dr. Dooley, thank you for joining Consumer Confidential. Those numbers we just talked about, specifically with the violence, the dating violence, really alarming. What should young people keep in mind when they're going out on a date? So I think it's really important that we equip our teenagers and young adults with the facts and the knowledge. First of all, they should know that about eight out of 10 instances of sexual assault occur between people who know each other. So I think that's really important for them to know. We also want them to know about the different types of violence. There's physical violence, emotional violence, and uh, sexual violence. And then lastly, we really want to start talking with our teens and young adults about what are the components of a healthy relationship. Are these relationships based on trust and honesty and independence and anger control and respect? Or are they relationships based on disrespect, dishonesty, a lack of anger control and a lack of trust? Dr. Dooley, how should parents navigate difficult conversations on these topics like substance abuse or consent? So first of all, just like you might have a packing list for your child's dorm or what they're gonna need for their academic course loads each year, also on your list should be having this conversation with your child. And I want parents to know that they're not alone. There are a number of resources out there to help guide parents. First and most importantly is committing to having the conversation. Secondly, mm -hmm. finding a quiet space and time in which to do it so you can really have a conversation with your child. Third, you might want to use something that's been in social media or current events as a way to open up the discussion and find out what your teenager knows. Where are they in their thinking and their knowledge about these topics? What are they seeing amongst their friends? And then finally, commit to being non-judgmental and really hearing mm -hmm. your teen and hearing what they've been seeing and experiencing are some great ways to open this conversation and navigate these difficult topics. And these aren't just one and done conversations, right, Dr. Dooley? Should you revisit this over time? Absolutely. It is so important that these conversations happen repeatedly and that maybe when you have that first conversation, you really set the stage to I hope this is the first of many conversations. You can mm -hmm. always come and speak to me about things you may have questions about or are concerned about. And even if I don't know the answer, I will try to find the correct information or answer for you. So repeated check-ins and conversations are critical. Thank you. I love that actual language that you're equipping parents with. What are some basic do's and don'ts when you are talking to your kids about these social dangers? So I think some important do's are making sure you make the time and the space for the conversation, asking open-ended questions. So really trying to let your child or young adult tell you what they think or what they know or what they've seen rather than asking questions that are just going to lead to yes or no answers. Mm -hmm. I also think that parents shouldn't be afraid to communicate their own values and expectations around substance abuse and sexual activity. And I think some don'ts are don't skip the conversation. It's a really critical conversation to have. Children are seeing a lot about relationships through social media. And I think it's really important that they see and learn and hear about relationships from their own parents as well. So don't skip the conversation and try not to get emotional. You may hear things that are hard to hear, but you really want mm -hmm. to create that open atmosphere for your teenager. Hold the judgment, as you said earlier. Dr. Dooley, what about, what about some red flags that your child might be in trouble? So red flags that your child might be having issues would be if you noticed a sudden withdrawal from activities or sports or organizations or things that they used to enjoy doing. If you noticed a decline in their studies or academics, 
If you notice they're just not participating in things like they used to, they may have mood changes and seem angry, hostile, depressed, or anxious. So all of those would be red flags that it's important to check in with your child. And you could also offer them the option that if they don't feel comfortable or ready to talk to you, is there someone at their school or their college that they would feel comfortable talking to at this point? Dr. Danielle Dooley, thank you so much. We so appreciate your time. And that is our time for now for all of us at NBC News. I'm Vicki Wint. Be sure to join me for another edition of Consumer Confidential right here on Today All Day. Hey everyone, welcome to your Wednesday Pop Start Plus. I'm Joe Fryer in for Carson, who's taking a little recovery time after back surgery. Coming up on today's show, the one and only Tyler Perry. He's written and directed a new film and gave us all the details. Then your rom-com fix with the film Wedding Season. And later on in our show, get ready Star Wars fans, we found a clip from the 1977 cast. But first, Chanel has today's Pop Start. First up, Saturday Night Live. Yesterday, we talked about the show's changing cast heading into the new season. Well, now we know the celebrity lineup who will be hosting oh. the season premiere. Do you want to see? Yes. yes. Here yes. we go. Kicking off the first episode is Top Gun Maverick star Miles Teller. Okay. He'll take the stage next Saturday with musical guest oh, Andrew wow. Lamar. Okay. On October 8th, Irish actor Brendan Gleeson, who you might recognize from movies like Harry Potter yeah. and Troy, makes his SNL debut along with singer Willow Smith. Wow. And on October 15th, Meg The Stallion is pulling double duty as both host and musical guest. Wow. Again, you can catch season 48 starting October 1st right here. Season on 48. NBC. Just That's think about that for a 40. second. Yeah. Uh, twice as long as Roger Federer. <laughs> there you go. Talk about longevity. I'm going to have some new faces this year, mm -hmm. so it should be good. All right, next up, Brad Pitt. How about this? He's an actor, mm -hmm. a producer, and an artist. Mm -hmm. For the first time ever, the Oscar winner is sharing some of his artwork. This is at the Sarah Hilden Art Museum in Finland. His sculptures are part of an exhibit that also features pieces by musician Nick Cave. And this week, Pitt spoke with a Finnish broadcaster about the meaning behind his debut pieces. For me, it's, it, it was born out of ownership of, of, of really what I call a, a radical inventory of self, getting really brutally honest with me and where we're um, taking account of, of those I may have hurt or, and those I, you know, in, in moments I've just gotten wrong. So many questions. He's an so actor and he's questions. a creative. Well, you know, I'm people like to create. And so like. you have to find a space to do that. Even if you go to Finland, you've he got to do really it, right? He sounds really introspective. Yeah. More and introspective so, than I've ever heard So of. I don't know if you saw those pictures there. The collection includes a molded plaster panel. It's mm -hmm. illustrating a gunfight. And then a clear house-shaped sculpture. It shows a bullet's trajectory. So his pieces will be on display through January. Okay. Okay. There you go. And finally, Savannah and Hoda. Take mm. a peek inside the latest edition of Us Weekly, and you'll find out what it's like to live a day in the life. Come on, get up. Today, <laughs> Savannah, Hoda, this feature is a timeline from one of your days right after the Queen died. Do you remember this? Part of it. Have you had well, a chance to see it? That was actually quite a wild day, wasn't it? We started the show. We thought we had. Some, we were. We, we did the NFL watch party, but then I ran off to London. We had, we had so a photo many, shoot. We had so many things planned that, that day. day. That got, yeah, and everything mm. got turned upside down. So they kind of followed us along on our two. We had kind of parallel paths. We mm. had a couple things together. Savannah ran to the airport. And but that's a day in the life. That's yeah. a day yeah. in the life. That's it what was, happened. It was, it was fun. fun. It was yeah. really fun. Congrats. Yeah. And we have some more headlines for you. We're missing Carson around here while he recovers from back surgery, but we're keeping up with him on season 22 of The Voice. Round two of Blind Auditions is kicked off, and the competition is already getting pretty fierce. Peyton Aldridge got three of the four judges to spin their chairs during his performance of Can't You See? And in an attempt to win over the Mississippi-based singer, John actually hopped on stage for a little duet. Check this out. Come on. Yeah, and you give me all of you. Oh. John also happened to throw down his block card on Team Blake, prompting Shelton to make this impassioned plea to sway Aldridge over to Team Gwen. You did have a great moment there with John singing, and it was very special.
but what would really have them talking tomorrow morning on the Today Show would be if after that moment happened, then you chose Gwen yeah, Stefani so. to be your coach. Yeah, and you'd be like, oh my gosh, Don't I can't believe him. he did that. Don't encourage him, people. Don't forget about the Today Show. We are talking about it on Today, but Blake, your master plan was only half a success. We're talking about it, but he did indeed go with Team Legend. All right, finally, Billy Eichner, the hilarious man on the street comedian, brought back his hit series, Billy on the Street, for a special edition episode to promote his new movie, Bros. And even after a three-year hiatus, Eichner easily slipped right back into his beloved on-screen persona, running up to unsuspecting New Yorkers and accosting them on the sidewalk. Plus, he had a little help from an Avenger. Miss Paul Rudd and I are rounding up straight women to go see bros! I got it! Yeah, go see bros! Miss, for a dollar, will you be seeing bros? Will you see bros? I'm sorry. Why, why? I'm sorry. I'm sorry I'm not Florence Pugh! My new movie, Bros. You ready for that? Somehow, Billy makes every New Yorker's nightmare of being approached by a stranger actually seem kind of fun. We're keeping our eyes peeled for you, Billy. And those are your Pop Star Plus headlines. Still ahead, Tyler Perry on his new film. He wrote and directed it. Don't go anywhere. We'll meet Ukrainians who are defending their country one block at a time. When you were still in Kiev, could you hear the bombing? My name is Lester. Who is this? News is happening now. Are you ready? Look at what's making headlines around the world. Right now on Morning News Now. We're coming on the air with breaking news. And this is a significant moment. Whenever it happens, wherever you are, NBC News, streaming free now. Allie Jackson Now, weekdays at 5 on NBC News Now. Live from Ukraine, from Uvalde, Texas, from Mayfield, Kentucky. To cover the news, you have to be in it. This is how so many towns and cities are protecting themselves. You can actually see they're pushing the gates open. Was there a school officer on campus? That's what we've been told. No. Do you remember any tornado as bad as this one? You look at this and you're thinking, we're not going to have power for weeks, if not months. Exactly. Every night, it's your news playlist. Top Story with Tom Yamas. Weeknights at 7 on NBC News Now. For breaking news in our changing world, download the NBC News app. Welcome back to Pop Start Plus. Tyler Perry's latest project is a film set in the late 1930s and 40s of Hopewell, Georgia. A jazz man's blues chronicles a tale of star-crossed lovers. And fun fact, it's based on a script that Perry actually wrote 27 years ago. He stopped by Studio 1A to fill us in on. Tyler Perry, good morning. Good morning. We love the fact that this was something you wrote. You were a kid when you wrote this, 27 years ago. You're about 26 years old, yeah, yeah. You're 26 years old. You put it in a drawer. You put it away. What made you decide, let me dust that off. Let me see if now's the time for Just it. watching what's, you know, I, I had to be strategic in what I was doing before, so I had to make sure I had hit after hit after hit. So this yeah. one I wanted to just take my time and do it at the right moment. But watching what's happening in our society where the banning of books, the watering down of history of black people in America, yeah. the homogenizing of slavery and Jim Crow. So I wanted to tell this story, and I thought now's the time. It's huh. a love story, but it's mm -hmm. also a story that does raise all of those issues. Yeah, yeah. When I think about you 27 years ago, 26 mm -hmm. years old, where were you in your mm -hmm. life when you wrote this? Struggling and broken. I, had, I got an opportunity. What I would do if, if I wanted to see a show, I would sneak in at intermission when everybody came out to smoke at the theater. Mm -hmm. So I went to the Alliance Theater and I saw an August Wilson play. I think it was Two Trains Running at the time. Mm. And I met him afterwards and he was so encouraging. He said, you know, write what's in your heart. And I went home and started writing Jazz Man. It all poured out of me. Mm, you yeah. know, it's like when you look at these actors, I'm surprised I, they're not household names. They're so good at what they do. But you found people who were uh, relatively new to the business, people who we don't know yet. Yeah, my, and my hope is that they become household names because they are brilliant yeah. in these performances. And I'm so proud of Josh and Solea and Austin. I can go mm. down the list of everybody. Mm -hmm. Amira, Mwana, I can go every, everybody. But I, I just wanted... Uh, 
I look back at what I've done in the past, and I was always at the forefront of uh, l launching or helping new mm -hmm. talent. You know, from a very young Idris Elba's first movie to Viola Davis working with me very <laughs> early on. on. So you got so an eye for talent. I'm, yeah. so, I'm hoping they. I'm hoping they have the same results. You know, I, I hear that you don't read reviews. No, no <laughs> but I, don't. I know that you know that this has received good reviews because none other than your friend Oprah called <laughs> yeah, you. Yeah. And did she really, she read one of these beautiful reviews what, to you? Yeah, she, the Variety review. She said, listen, um, did you see it? I was like, no, I just, I can't let any of that in. I just, no, it's really, I was like, no, no, no. She said, I'm going to read it. No, 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 oh. can you read it? No, I'm reading it to you on the phone. She read She read the review <laughs> on the phone and got emotional halfway through it because she, she's just so, Oprah's just so happy for me. Why is she moment. so proud of you? Yeah. I, I think it's just, it's just a genuine thing because I've known her for 18 years now and she's watched my growth through all of this and she's just such a wonderful person. You said back when you you were 26, you were broke, you were just mentioning to Savannah, and I remember listening to you, I don't know whether it was an interview with me or something you mm -hmm. said, but I remember it so vividly. You lived in New Orleans, and you said when you were younger, you used to drive down like St. Charles Avenue mm -hmm. where there are beautiful homes when you didn't have any money because you wanted to see where you were gonna live. Yeah. And you would go to parking lots where they were selling cars and you wanted to get behind the wheel of like a Mercedes because you wanted to feel the car that you were gonna drive. Tell me about that idea. You had to see yeah. before you could actually have. Exposure, it's exposure, like the understanding of that I can have these things, that this is possible because other people have it, why can't I? And it wasn't necessarily about the material things as much as it was about the idea of dreaming and touching and feeling. I think just having exposure to things around the world has changed my entire outlook on yeah. so much. And I think that if more of us could, we would just be people that could evolve into understanding more cultures and people and, and respecting each other. So exposure is really important. I'm not talking about a Mercedes in a house. I'm talking about <laughs> yeah, just yeah, yeah. exposure life, and life. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah, but where sure. did that belief come from? Yeah. Because, I mean, it's deep within you, yeah. mm -hmm. even in your darkest day, even yeah. with mm -hmm. all of the difficulties of your childhood, which mm -hmm. you've talked about. Deep down, you knew, mm -hmm. it seems. Yeah. You knew you were headed for great things. I, well, I, I was very, very hopeful, but but my mother took me to church every Sunday. My my I, uh, grandfather was a minister. I went to seminary school for a while as mm -hmm. a teenager. So I had this, I've always had this tremendous deep faith, and I just always believed that things will work out. And mm -hmm. to be in this place and feel it and see it working out and it inspiring so many other people. That's what I was going to say. I love it. Yeah. It's like the paying yeah. forward piece mm -hmm. of your life that I'm so into, too. Yeah. It's like, you're on top of the mountain and you're like, you come up here with me, you come up here with me. Like, that's what you're, that's what you're doing. I don't feel like it's that selective <laughs> as much as I feel like there are people who, like even at the studio, people, I have people who are working for me who've been in jail for six, 12, 20 years and they come out, they're in the grip in the electric department and the whole studio is just people coming in, the eyes wider than anything you it. could imagine. I love it. Never having a chance to, to have these kind of opportunities. Yeah. So it's awesome. And you're giving the shot. That's, thank you. We love you, by the way, Tyler. I love we really you. do. We do. It's just so inspiring and so proud of you this yeah. is an amazing amazing project Thanks. 27 years in the making but right on time yeah, thank you. we should mention you can find a jazz man's blues on netflix coming up we're diving into the rom-com wedding season stay with us live from ukraine from uvalde texas from mayfield kentucky to cover the news you have to be in it this is how so many towns and cities are protecting themselves. You can actually see they're pushing the gates open. Was there a school officer on campus? That's what we've been told. No. Do you remember any tornado as bad as this one? You look at this and you're thinking, we're not going to have power for weeks, if not months. Exactly. Every night, it's your news playlist. Top Story with Tom Yamas. Weeknights at 7 on NBC News Now. Good evening from New Orleans. Nice to really spend some time with you. Appreciate it. For breaking news in our changing world, download the NBC News app. Live from Ukraine, from Uvalde, Texas, from Mayfield, Kentucky. To cover the news, you have to be in it. This is how so many towns and cities are protecting themselves. You can actually see they're pushing the gates open. Was there a school officer on campus? That's what we've been told. No. Do you remember any tornado as bad as this one? You look at this and you're thinking, we're not going to have power for weeks, if not months. Exactly. Every night. 
It's your news playlist. Top Story with Tom Yamas. Weeknights at 7 on NBC News Now. Today is now a podcast. Available every morning. Listen wherever you get your podcasts. For breaking news in our changing world, download the NBC News app. Today is now a podcast. Available every morning. Listen wherever you get your podcasts. Top Story with Tom Yamas. Weeknights at 7 on NBC News Now. We're back here on Popstar Plus. Have you ever needed a wedding date so badly you thought about pretending to date someone? Well, that's actually what happens in the film Wedding Season. And Donna Farrison spoke to its stars about the story and how it highlights South Asian storytelling. I'm really excited for the two of you. I want to get right into wedding season. Did this movie hit close to home for you two? Definitely after we shot the film, I started to notice things more. I was like, oh, yeah, people are getting married. People are stressed about this stuff. Like A lot of my friends are now married. All my, most of my exes from a previous lifetime are all married. I went to four That's weddings huge. in the last five months. I know the feeling. Yeah. Four weddings in the last five months. Four weddings in the last, all Indian weddings, all crazy. Pallavi, how would you describe wedding season? I would describe it as a lens, as a really beautiful lens into one aspect of a very broad archetype that is South Asian culture as it exists in, you know, diasporic communities. And as I said, as a lens through which we can create intercultural understanding and empathy. I think as someone who grew up Indian Australian, I'm very cognizant of the fact that we're often expected to be obedient and compliant and quiet in the face of the host society, so to speak. And I think that wedding season is incredibly empowering as far as a woman who takes up space and starts to believe that she is able to do that within her family, within her personal relationships, within the workplace. Yeah, I just think it's like a, it's a beacon. It's a beacon for what we ought to be able to do in terms of living through love and not fear. Ravi. Literally the only reason I agreed to meet you here was so that my mom would stop posting my profile online. Mm -hmm. So this... Us. Is never gonna happen? Never gonna happen. How can you be so sure of that? Because our parents set this up. What drew you to your roles and how similar are you to your characters? Well, what drew me to Asha is many things I will say. First of all, the film as a whole, I think has a really important part to play in the conversation around, you know, breaking down the binary of us and them in, you know, the modern lexicon of what it is to exist in society. And I think that this film goes a long way towards the actualization of this idea that we are all one. And it just is by shining a light on the normalcy of a family who lives in Jersey, who happens to be Indian um, or American of Indian origin. And then Asha's just a cool cat. She's a maverick, just like me. <laughs> and for me, it was just like finding a project where you're suddenly surrounded by South Asians in the creative space. Mm. It just rarely ever happens. It, it never happens. If you're of any minority and you're, let's just say an actor for now, you find yourself feeling quite alone. You're like, all right, I'm doing this alone again, you know? To suddenly realize the bigger picture and how many people have given their souls and life to this is a joy. And getting to work on this, specifically on this project was a dream. And obviously with her, it was fun. It was a learning really a experience. Yeah. Yeah. If we join forces, we won't have to deal with all of this. I'm not interested in a pretend relationship, okay? Do this for your parents at least until wedding season is over. What was it like bringing this experience, you know, to life and this project to life behind the scenes for you? Oh my goodness. It was, you know, first of all, I guess if I actually now sit back and, and look at the journey that I've been on and the fact that I dreamt of being an actress when I was very, I was probably two or three when I said I want to grow up and be an actress. And the actualization of that is kind of unbelievable, even statistically speaking. So to be a part of that beginning phase is something that I think people like myself and Suraj have been working towards for a long time. And 
now to have someone like yourself even recognize that and ask that question, it just means that it's working and we are moving the needle forward and it's the work is being seen. We are being seen. We are representing others that will be seen and we break down the monolithic stereotypes of what it is to be a person of color of South Asian descent on screen, but also in the broader community. Mm. Um, and I think that's ultimately the aim of storytelling. And one thing to that is that, you know, many times it's like, okay, wow, you're a South Asian actor, like on screen, you must really be changing things, you know? The real change happens behind the camera and then in front of the movie screen. So in that regard, this was a gem. Mm -hmm. Being surrounded by all these South Asians who've been at different stages in their lives, mm -hmm. all with a common struggle and with this team behind it, you know, right off the bat, there was intention with this, as intention, and that hits deep. Well, and, and thinking about, you know, the authenticity of this storytelling and also in the representation, the South Asian representation behind the scenes and in front of the camera, what do you hope audiences take away from this movie? Who is this movie for? Everyone. Everyone. <laughs> and if anything I want to be taken away is a little bit of understanding. Mm -hmm. It's like, how am I supposed to accept or understand this group mm -hmm. if I've never communicated, if I don't have any insight into their lives, if I don't see the normalcy, the common struggles? Yeah. It's through things like this. It's through conversation, mm -hmm. whether it be conversation through media, conversation in person. That's what, if I hope the people take away a lot of fun, because this is fun, and a little bit of understanding. Yeah, yeah. that's what breeds empathy. We should mention you can catch Wedding Season on Netflix. Up next from our vault, a Star Wars deep dive. Stick with us. For breaking news in our changing world, download the NBC News app. Top Story with Tom Yamas, weeknights at 7 on NBC News Now. Good evening from New Orleans. Nice to really spend some time with you. Appreciate it. News is happening now. To look at what's making headlines around the world. We're coming on the air with breaking news. This is a significant moment. Whenever it happens, wherever you are, NBC News, streaming free now. News is happening now. Are you ready? Look at what's making headlines around the world. Right now on Morning News Now. We're coming on the air with breaking news. And this is a significant moment. Whenever it happens, wherever you are, NBC News, streaming free now. Top Story with Tom Yamas, weeknights at 7 on NBC News Now. Welcome back. Mark Hamill, a.k.a. Luke Skywalker, turned 71 this weekend. And in his honor, we pulled an absolutely terrific clip from our vault. Here he is alongside Harrison Ford and the late, great Carrie Fisher back in 1977, speaking about Star Wars as the film was first being released. With me are three stars of Star Wars. Carrie Fisher, who plays the princess, Mark Hamill, who plays the innocent and brave young hero, and Harrison Ford, the only movie actor named after two presidents, who is the dashing, daring space pilot who helps them all escape from danger. Good morning, all. Good, Good morning. morning. <laughs> is that nice to be named after two presidents? It's, it's never come up before. <laughs> <laughs> well, they're two of the most famous presidents in American history. I'm gratified. <laughs> Carrie, did you like playing? Is this your this is your first Prince. lead? Your first princess? Yeah. Your first lead part? Yes, it is. Did you like doing it? A lot. We had a lot of fun doing it. Isn't it different from anything you're likely ever to do again? Because isn't most of the background put in afterwards, or all these process shots and animation? What did you play against very often? You three were you in blank studios where they put the background in later? Blue yeah. Blue screen mostly. 
but, but the, th the thing that... Uh, I mean, a big blank blue screen? Yeah, it looked you? like a big movie screen that was tinted blue. Uh, the thing is, it's, it, it wasn't any more difficult to imagine gigantic spaceships coming through than it is to drive in a mock-up car where you're being pulled by a truck and there's a where you're supposed to see road and there's a, a camera crew and somebody doing the crossword and variety, bored, you know, so it was, it's all just using your imagination. For those who have not yet seen any of Star Wars, aside from what you are seeing right there, which is the kind of background that these three people played against, Harrison, why don't you tell us a little bit about a film clip we can now see. All right. Uh, a little episode from the film and then we'll see it. All right. This is the escape from the Death Star. Mark and I and uh, Sir, Sir Alec is, oh dear, I'm beginning to get a little confused. We're, this is the escape from the Death Star. We have the princess, we've wrested her away from the evil forces of the Empire. And we're about to make, we make our escape and they're following us. Okay, so now we are going to see a scene from Star Wars with lots of action. Again, kid? Okay, stay sharp. that moment in any theater where Star Wars is playing, the audience absolutely cheers. I have not seen, with the exception of Rocky, in the last few years, the kind of audience participation and audience reaction for and to a film that yeah. we have for Star Wars. It's great to sit in a theater and see people really enjoy something like that. Have you done it? Have you been? Yeah. Any of you? Have oh, you gone yes. to see a theater just oh, yeah. anonymously, just go in as a patron? It's sure. easy to be anonymous at this point, <laughs> really. Nobody recognizes us when we go into a theater, which is a pleasure, I must say. Nobody recognizes you? Just one guy who'd seen it uh, 12 times, <laughs> and he, he asked me What was his reaction? Out. He asked uh, you he, out? Yeah. The princess. No, I first told him that I was the prize, that the 20th Century Fox office that had heard he'd seen it 12 times, and he got a free date with the princess and a bucket of popcorn. Tickets punched, did you but he believed me. <laughs> How'd you get this role? Um, mafia. It's a lot about the mafia, this film. No, no, no. How did you really get this role? Uh, well, George was seeing everybody that could walk into the office, so I could do that, and uh, I tested for it. And they mailed the test over to George, who was scouting locations in London, and I got it. She's hired by mail, you see. <laughs> how, how do you do audition for a film in which most of your acting is in front of a blue screen? Unbelievable the way this came about. I wish I could say I walked in and he said, there's Luke Skywalker. I walked in, George was having joint interviews with Brian De Palma, who was cast in Carrie. <laughs> <laughs> Every five minutes there, were, there, was, there was another person waiting just to talk and we didn't, I never saw a script. I got five pages after that initial meeting in the mail. They said, memorize it, show up, you're going to test with this guy. 
And uh, believe me, I said, it was, it was never that George Lucas ever said, well, this is what we're going to do. This is kind of a, he said, let's just do it. And you knew George Lucas because you were in one of his other big hits, American Graffiti, and very yeah. good in that, I yeah. must say. You've been in two enormous, popular successes. American Graffiti is one of the top 25 money makers, and yeah. this is going to be sky high, you should pardon the expression. Well, the name of the movie is Star Wars. It is going to be one of the biggest money-making movies of our time, no doubt about it. One of the big hits of the summer. And these are three of the non-robots <laughs> from Star Wars. A marvelous time capsule moment right there. You can find some amazing things in today's vault. Okay, everyone, that is another Pop Star Plus in the books. Hope you learned something new, and we'll see you right back here tomorrow. New York City is home to so many iconic foods. But when the city that never sleeps wakes up for breakfast, they want a bagel with a cream cheese schmear piled high with locks. There's no other city that makes a bagel like a New York City bagel. I have not had good bagels in any other city. I came out the wound eating bagels. It's time to head out of Studio 1A and hit the road for a new kind of culinary adventure. Follow me as I taste some of the most iconic foods around the country and meet the families behind them. Together, we're going to learn how a good meal has the power to connect us to our past, our future, and each other. If New York's known for anything, it's its bagels. And we got them all. Everything bagels, rainbow bagels, pumpkin bagels, croissant bagels, and of course you can't have them without a schmear. While the bagel first came from Poland, many food historians say its pairing with salmon and cream cheese originated right here in the Big Apple. In this town, few specialty food shops are as beloved and as historic as Russ and Daughters. I've been waiting in line probably 15, 20 minutes, but it's definitely worth it. I like the, the contrast of the flavor. It's like a nice little bagel with a with salty locks. Something about the salmon and cream cheese together, like I try to make it at home, but it's nothing compared to Russ and Daughters. They've been serving premium smoked fish to hungry New Yorkers and folks from around the world for over 100 years. Just a few blocks from the store is the Russ and Daughters Cafe. Hi, Al. Hey, how are you? Welcome to the Russell Daughters Cafe. Nice to see it's you. It's great guys. to have you here. Thanks for having us. This is beautiful. Thank you. Nikki Russ Fetterman and Josh Russ Tupper are the grandchildren of the original daughters. These cousins are fourth generation owners carrying on their family's culinary legacy. So, this is Russ and Daughters. Wow. This is our great grandfather, Joel Russ, who started the business his wife, Bella, and his three daughters. Um, we, Josh and I have the same grandmother, and she was the youngest of the three. Was it unusual at that time for, because you, you usually you'd see so-and-so and sons, yeah. but to see Russ and daughters. Very unusual. But I mean, honestly, if he had had sons, it probably would have been Russ and sons. Well, thank but goodness he did. We like exactly. to think of him as a feminist, but he was a good businessman. Joel Russ immigrated from Poland in 1907. And he started, just standing on the streets of the Lower East Side selling schmaltz herring out of a barrel. And a family could feed itself for two nights with one fish. In 1914, he opened his first brick and mortar shop, J. Russ National Appetizing. Joel and his wife had three daughters, Hattie, Ida, and Anne. When they turned 11, each daughter began working with their dad. What was their relationship like with him? I, because uh, he's your dad, but he's also your boss. Your boss. Yeah. And I think he cared more about being the boss and the shopkeeper. He was a new immigrant to this country who was just trying to survive and make a place for his family. And that was his focus. And he saw his children as, as you know, cheap labor. The sisters grew up learning all aspects of the business. In 1935, Hattie, Ida, and Anders. The shop was renamed Russ and Daughters, 
making it the first in America to bear and daughters in its title. When your great-grandfather decided to, to start Russ and Daughters, why the Lower East Side? After Ellis Island, this was the starting off point for the majority of poor Jewish immigrants. This is where they landed and they got their start. And so he was just feeding basic food to other poor immigrants like himself. At the turn of the century, this neighborhood was one of the most densely populated places on the planet. Many immigrants from all around the world lived in overcrowded tenement buildings, the conditions having a profound impact on their diets. One of the things about Lower East Side Jewish food is that a lot of food wasn't made at home. When you don't have running water or when you don't have uh, electric or gas stoves, it's really hard to do very much cooking. And so for, for women who are responsible for feeding their families, they had to get food from push carts, from restaurants, from bakeries. Joel Russ was one of many vendors catering to this new population. I've, I've always been curious, how did it come about, or from what you've heard, that somebody thought, hey, you know, here's this round bread, we'll put some fish on it, but oh, by the way, before we do, let's put some cream cheese, some dairy on it. Yeah. First of all, Russ and Daughters is the torchbearer of what's called appetizing. And this is a food tradition born here in New York, and it's the sister food tradition to delicatessen, both of which come up through the Jewish kosher dietary rules. You have to separate fish and dairy from meat. So a delicatessen, strictly speaking, is for meat. The appetizing store is where you go for fish and dairy, things like herring, smoked fish. When we say bagel and lox, most people are, you know, we're referring to a smoked salmon. But sure. the original bagel and lox was not with smoked salmon. Technically, lox, or belly lox, is salmon cured in salt, which preserves fish without refrigeration. There's no smoking involved, and it's incredibly salty, so it pairs perfectly with tangy cream cheese. But who was the first person to put lox on a bagel? So no one really knows how bagels, lox, and cream cheese all came together. We know that bagels come from Eastern Europe. We know that lox kind of comes basically from Nova Scotia, kind of. We know the cream cheese is an American food. But what we know is that these things come together as part of a compromise between different generations of American Jews. Jewish law prohibits cooking with most heat sources on the Sabbath. So the combo of bagels and lox created a filling meal for observant Jews to enjoy on the day of rest. It's good for a family, but you or your daughter-in-law didn't have to be spending the, the previous day cooking. As one of the country's oldest appetizing stores, Russ and Daughters has been serving kosher meals for generations. And the weekends are still their busiest days. I can't think really of th anything that's more New York than lox and bagels. I agree. I think that this is a food that came up through the Eastern European Jewish immigrants to New York. But now it's it transformed and just become New York food. It belongs to all New Yorkers. News is happening now. Look at what's making headlines around the world. Right now on Morning News Now. We're coming on the air with breaking news. And this is a significant moment. Whenever it happens, wherever you are, NBC News, streaming free now. Ukrainians were defending their country one block at a time. When you were still in Kiev, could you hear the bombing? My name is Lester. Who is this? For breaking news in our changing world, download the NBC News app. These days, it feels like the news never stops. So let's get into it. What's happening right now, what it all means for you for an hour every day. It can be hard to keep up, so let's get started together. Allie Jackson Now, weekdays at 5 on NBC News Now. For breaking news in our changing world, download the NBC News app. 
Ukrainians were defending their country one block at a time. When you were still in Kiev, could you hear the bombing? My name is Lester. Who is this? In the United States, women own less than 20% of all businesses. At the iconic Russ and Daughters, co-owner Nikki Russ Betterman is building on the legacy of her grandmother and great aunts. Growing up, you, you follow in the footsteps of, of strong women who may not have chosen this, but took it on and obviously made it really successful. What is it like for you following in those footsteps? It's a tremendous feeling to be now the and great-granddaughter Justice Ruth Bader Ginsburg was a good customer of ours. Her family came from the Lower East Side. And she once said that before she knew the word feminist, when she looked up at the sign, Russ and Daughter, she understood that women could have an impact. Your family's business, Russ and Daughter, has survived two world wars, a depression. You're here in the shadow of the World Trade Center. Yes. Why has this place been able to not just survive, but thrive? I think because in each generation there has been someone who wanted to do this. This is food that people turn to for comfort in hard times. And during the pandemic, we saw that, you know, people were shipping Russ and Daughters all over the country to their loved ones because they couldn't be together. And so sending, you know, bagels and locks and babka, say, you know, I love you, I miss you. Here, let me feed you. Having a schmear over Zoom. Oh, there was a lot of that. <laughs> okay, so you can get smoked fish pretty much everywhere these days, but not quite like this. The salmon sold at Russ and Daughters is prized for its high fat content, from the milder Gaspe Nova to the smokier Scottish. And this gourmet fish is all sliced by hand. When you hold it up, I mean, it's it's almost translucent. That. Yeah, I think we should show you how we get at that then. Yeah, me and a sharp utensil, what could possibly go wrong? <laughs> it takes up to six months of training to master the slicing technique here. So Al, I hear you have some knife skills. Well, I've been in a fight or two, but uh, <laughs> it's uh, probably nothing like yours. So how, how long have you been slicing salmon? I've been at the store for 20 years. Wow. Um, so I've been slicing for a while. All right. So, so uh, I watch people slice, and I, uh, I'm amazed at, at how patient, because it seems like that's part of the, the skill. The reality is, when you know how to slice, mm -hmm. it is one of the most relaxing things you can do. Very zen. Very zen. Ooh. Meditative, right? Mm. The trick is don't look anywhere on the fish. You have to really feel the fish. Be the fish. Be the fish which is a very difficult concept to train I someone. Um, and particularly the first couple slices are, mm. don't be upset okay. if they don't look great. The idea is to make a consistently thick slice. You making so, faces at me? No, I'm just watching you not watch the fish. <laughs> All right. Okay. Here we go. Be the fish. Not looking. You should, you should look. I should you look. You got a sharp knife in your hand, Al. And you can see that as you change the angle of the knife, it changes the thickness. Yeah. Right? So now that's Drastically, a very... Drastically, more than a, you think. That's more than... Oh, my gosh. That's a very thick... We call those chuletas. Chuletas? Yeah. Chops. Ah. In Spanish. I was going to say, that sound... That, that didn't sound <laughs> Yiddish. Not, not that Yiddish. did not sound not Yiddish, Yiddish to me. Yeah. Does the way you cut it affect the taste of it or the texture of it? The texture, which uh, affects the experience of the salmon. It's almost like you're eating the essence of salmon not salmon. It's very delicate. It's a very appealing mm -hmm. texture and, and mouthfeel. Mm -hmm. Yeah, the thinner. Josh, thanks so much. Nice meeting you. Such a pleasure to have you. Ah, smoke them if you got them. Up next, how fresh salmon gets turned into locks. NBC News, streaming free now. Top Story with Tom Yamas, weeknights at 7 on NBC News Now. News is happening now. Are you ready? 
look at what's making headlines around the world. Right now on Morning News Now. We're coming on the air with breaking news. And this is a significant moment. Whenever it happens, wherever you are, NBC News, streaming free now. Today is now a podcast, available every morning. Listen wherever you get your podcasts. Top Story with Tom Yamas, weeknights at 7 on NBC News Now. Today is now a podcast, available every morning. Listen wherever you get your podcasts. For breaking news in our changing world, download the NBC News app. Live from Ukraine, from Uvalde, Texas, from Mayfield, Kentucky. To cover the news, you have to be in it. This is how so many towns and cities are protecting themselves. You can actually see they're pushing the gates open. Was there a school officer on campus? That's what we've been told. No. Do you remember any tornado as bad as this one? You look at this and you're thinking, we're not going to have power for weeks, if not months. Exactly. Every night, it's your news playlist. Top Story with Tom Yamas. Weeknights at 7 on NBC News Now. NBC News. Streaming free now. Ukrainians who are defending their country one block at a time. When you were still in Kiev, could you hear the bombing? My name is Lester. Hey, who's this? I'm here at the Acme Smoked Fish Factory. Now there is something fishy going on in there, and you better believe I'm gonna find out what it is. The folks at Acme process, smoke, and pack nearly eight million pounds of fish every year. They sell to eateries all over the country, including Russ and Daughters. It smells of smoke and it smells of fish. That's the way it's supposed to be. It smells right. like New York City. Yes. All right, so as you know, in any food food plant, food safety is uh -huh. of paramount importance. Right. I see you got your boots on I here. just happen to be wearing these. Awesome. <laughs> I'll walk you through the process of how salmon turns into smoked salmon. Adam Kaslow is the fourth generation owner of Acme Smoked Fish. His great grandfather, Harry Brownstein, started selling fish after immigrating from Russia to Brooklyn. Wow. Harry started in the smoked fish business in the early 1900s, in 1906 to be exact. Out, he of, would, out of a push cart? Out of a, 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 a horse-drawn wagon. Wow. He would go around buying fish from different smokehouses throughout Brooklyn and Queens and had himself the sales route. You know, he worked close to 45 years. I mean, his dream was to open up his own smokehouse, and it took him 45 years to finally achieve that. Wow. Adam now runs a massive smoked fish empire, supplying many of New York City's popular bagel shops, from H&H &H to Essa Bagel. Acme also selling to national grocers, like Trader Joe's. At the end of the day, uh -huh. it's all about the fish. We bring in fish from all over the world. Uh -huh. Smoked salmon is probably the most popular thing that we make, and our salmon come from different places, Norway, Scotland, Chile, and Alaska. It can take up to five days to make smoked salmon. Every order is made to the buyer's tastes, from the type of salmon to the curing method. The first step, cutting a whole fish into fillets. Whoa! Yeah. So this is a 12 kilo whole salmon Jeez. that I caught over here in Long Island Sound. No, I'm just kidding. <laughs> this is an Atlantic salmon. Uh -huh. It's farm, farm raised. We use Atlantic salmon because it has the, the most fat and fat equals flavor when making smoked, smoked salmon. Right. So what are you cutting out the, like the backbone there? Yeah, just do your bone. Uh-huh. Carving into a fish this size requires expert hands. After the fish is filleted, it's preserved with salt. The fish is then treated with a wet brine or a dry cure. Okay, so let's dry, dry cure some, some salmon. 
Good. First thing, we're gonna get it onto the uh, raft. Okay. okay. So, see if you can pick up this salmon, grab it by the by the, the tail. Okay. Grab with your other hand. Underneath. And we're gonna lay it onto this the, the screen. Okay. Perfect. Great. Step two, we're gonna grab a handful of salt. So it's just a thin layer. Yep. Right along the top of the dorsal. Like kind of down the center line, I suppose. And we'll give it a nice love, love tap. That's it? That's it. This fish is rather large. So traditionally, we would probably uh, wet brine uh -huh. this, this fish. But for smaller fish, the, the dry cure lasts about 24 hours. Okay. That's a huge fish. Right. After curing, the fillets are cold smoked for up to 20 hours. This process imparts a subtle smoky flavor. Let me show you how the smoker works. So these are a collection of that wood chip blend that we were uh -huh. talking about earlier. There are different ways to smoke fish fillets. Hot smoking results in flaky, opaque fillets. Unlike traditional lox, smoked salmon is cold smoked below 85 degrees. This helps the fish retain its silky texture and makes it perfect for slicing. Ready to help me get this bad boy into the You oven? bet. All right. All right, hey now, let's close her up. Woo, shut her down. After the smoker, the fish is cooled, then packed for shipping. What would your great grandfather say if he could see all of this? I think he'd be amazed at how difficult it was for him to achieve his dream. Right. And now his descendants have been able to build upon that dream and build us into one of the preeminent smokers in the US. Up next, a vegan deli taking on tradition with plant-based lox and cashew cream cheese? Oh, you don't want to miss this. Today is now a podcast, available every morning. Listen wherever you get your podcasts. Live from Ukraine, from Uvalde, Texas, from Mayfield, Kentucky. To cover the news, you have to be in it. This is how so many towns and cities are protecting themselves. You can actually see they're pushing the gates open. Was there a school officer on campus? That's what we've been told. No. Do you remember any tornado as bad as this one? You look at this and you're thinking, we're not going to have power for weeks, if not months. Exactly. Every night. It's your news playlist. Top Story with Tom Yamas. Weeknights at 7 on NBC News Now. News is happening now. Are you ready? Look at what's making headlines around the world. Right now on Morning News Now. We're coming on the air with breaking news. And this is a significant moment. Whenever it happens, wherever you are. NBC News, streaming free now. The day's biggest political stories with trusted insight now and expert analysis now. A daily look at the politics behind the headlines. Meet the Press Now, streaming weekdays at 4 p.m. on NBC News Now. Top Story with Tom Yamas, weeknights at 7 on NBC News Now. Now tonight with Joshua Johnson, streaming weeknights at 8 on NBC News Now. Back on the Lower East Side, two sisters, inspired by their Jewish heritage, are on a mission to make the food they loved growing up in a more sustainable way. Ladies, nice to meet you. Nice to meet Boom. you. Want to show me around? Please, come Play, on in. Lead away. Erica and Sarah Kaberski are the co-owners of Orchard Grocer, an entirely vegan market inspired by classic delicatessens. This is our healthy cashew cheese. They want to make the vegan lifestyle easier for all. Right after college, they opened their first business, a shoe store called Moo Shoes. We opened our vegan shoe store 20 years ago. How are they? They're comfortable? About five years ago, we decided that we were gonna update it by adding our vegan grocer. 
basically because it seemed like that's what our customers want. Um, after asking us what our shoes were made of, probably where should I go eat was um, the second most common question. So we decided to create an experience where they could just go eat next door. Growing up in Queens, the sisters' Jewish culture and food were closely linked. They had 10 Jewish delis in their neighborhood alone. Probably every Sunday, a tradition in our family, a dozen bagels um, at the bagel store. A dozen always meant 15. I don't know why that was, but and uh, with the cream cheese and lox, and that was just uh, how we spent our Sundays. Both sisters became vegan as teenagers, but felt they lost a piece of their roots by giving up certain foods. I think our parents were supportive of our changes to the vegan lifestyle. We grew up in a very culturally Jewish household, so all of our traditions were just based around food. Today, a lot of folks are going vegan for a variety of reasons, from reported health benefits to concerns over animal welfare. For the sisters, it's also a matter of global importance. Now we're watching climate change happen right now, and. I think that's causing a lot of people to think twice about what they're eating and how they are contributing. So it makes sense to us that it is becoming so mainstream. In 2017, Sarah and Erica saw not just an opportunity to satisfy a growing market, but to pay homage to their Jewish roots. We wanted to have a, a good sandwich selection that really epitomizes like New York deli food. So obviously a bagel and mox was gonna be there. Orchard Grocer sells a variety of vegan sandwiches, including Reuben's and tuna melts. But the sisters are most passionate about serving up a sense of nostalgia. People are so worried about giving things up. So I think just creating those alternatives and just something that people are familiar with and gives them that feeling of home. Yeah, like we haven't had to give up our Sunday tradition of um, bagels and lox. To help make their unique deli a reality, the sisters hired vegan chef Nora Vargas. Nora shares a passion for plant-based foods. She also knows how to turn carrots into salty locks. How did you come up? I mean, you have to think, okay, what can mimic uh, mm -hmm. a smoked salmon? Yeah. Uh, so how did you, was it look like, like you yeah. thought, well, the only orange vegetable out there, <laughs> exactly. other than a sweet potato, <laughs> is carrot. We know the texture that we need to go for. We know the flavor that we want to go for so we started with the color and then we just kind of built it from there okay so let's get started I'm, I'm really fascinated okay all right I'm excited so we have prepared what do we have maybe 10 pounds of carrots here wow. for you these are huge these would have been huge carrots seriously yeah like wow. the size of my forearm but you <laughs> you have you have Slice them very thin on a mandolin? Yes, yeah, okay. exactly. All right, so we're all gloved up and we are going to, the next step in this process is to uh, apply our rub okay. to our carrots. So in here we have a mixture of sugar, salt, and the rest I can't tell you about. Oh, it's a secret exactly. kind of thing. So yeah. this, this would be kind of like the brine that you would mm -hmm. use, the dry brine that you would use yes. on fish. Exactly. Except yeah. it's going on vegetables. Yeah. We got our inspiration for a lot of different components of this recipe from the way that you would actually prepare fish if we were preparing fish and not carrots. Right. Coat everything. Hmm. Interesting. Oh no, don't smell it. Don't, don't figure out the secret just I'm, by smelling I'm, it. Okay, now. Because if I figure it out, she's going to have to kill me. <laughs> So I'm just going to start rubbing, just smushing everything in there. Once we get everything coated, we would let this sit for three to six hours, mm -hmm. probably. Okay, great. So I think we've, I think we nailed it. Okay. In here. Is another secret ingredient? Definitely. Jeez, yeah, a, but I can tell you. A lot you. of secrets here at Orchard. <laughs> I'll tell you a little bit. Okay. Okay. So it's a combination of olive oil mm -hmm. and aquafaba. Aquafaba? Yeah. Are you familiar with that ingredient? I don't know. You know when you're opening up a can of beans right. and you got to drain them? Yes. The stuff that you drain out, that's aquafaba. Aquafaba. It's, like, it's bean water. It's bean, bean juice. Yes, exactly. Okay. Yeah. Okay, so I'm going to pour okay. and then you can kind of do the same process. Okay, that we same did before. process. Just squish it all in there, okay? Yeah, perfect. After we had let our carrots sit for three to six hours, right. um, we tossed them in the oven. So they bake. We like to call it cold smoking, just ah. to sound like classy. Um, like the process of making smoked salmon. Exactly, yeah. That does look very much like smoked salmon. <laughs> 
And what would a bagel and lox be without the cream cheese? This vegan spread is made with raw cashews, salt, some secret spices, and coconut oil, all blended together with soft tofu. Should we make a bagel? Sure, let's do it. Chai Tonkin. Cheers. This is a really terrific idea. Thank I'm, you. Thank you for opening my eyes. Oh, thank you so much. I appreciate it. That yeah. was fantastic. Like it was a great way to finish things up. I mean, we've, we've seen the history. We've gone to the past. We were in the present. And you have brought us the locks and bagels of the future. <laughs> a bagel with cream cheese and smoked salmon is a uniquely American combination. Born from Jewish roots, transformed by local ingredients, and carried on by new generations. This breakfast tradition has truly stood the test of time when it comes to food in New York City. Well, it's good to see you, John. It's good to be here. Um, I saw the movie last week. And? So, I don't know if I can put into words how much I loved it. And part of it is because it's a great movie on its own. And part of it is because I was going into sixth grade when the original came okay. out. And it was so formative for so many of us. Sure. I think you included. Yeah, I think I was probably around eighth grade, but yeah. Yeah. I've described the movie like this. It perfectly rides the line between the, the, the newness of it and its originality and nostalgia. It's perfect. It's got both of those things. It's a great news story. It's a continuation of the story of Maverick and all the Iceman and all the people that we've known throughout seeing the fir first film. And then it's this this uh, throwback again uh, to to making you feel like you were when you were in sixth grade or eighth grade or whatever it was, the 80s. And by the way, it starts with the opening credits of the movie. There's a piece of music that comes in and I was like, it drops you I right back, back into it. Yeah, you drop sure. right back in. It's incredible. So given your experience with the movie, given the experience we all had with the movie, when they call you about this, does it blow your mind to even consider the possibility of I being... just remember thinking, like, I, if my eighth grade self could talk to my now self, both of us would not be computing that this is happening. So it was a, it was a no-brainer for me. I was just like, are you kidding? Yes, I don't know. I don't care what the what the part is. I would be in craft service on this thing if I could. But, you know, then I got like a cool call sign. Yeah. And it's like, you know, I, I, they, they put me in the wardrobe. I was like, are you kidding me? Like, this is amazing. I can't believe I get to do this. Like, I'm literally on an aircraft carrier saluting Tom Cruise. Like, this is this is not happening. It was a tremendous delight to, to, to make. And, and it's, I cannot wait for people to see the film. So your cyclone, that's the call sign you're referring my, to. That's my, my call sign. So describe a little bit for the audience who your character is, how he fits into the story. I'm, I'm the air boss, so I'm, I'm in charge. And like most people that runs into Pete Maverick Mitchell, I don't love the way he uh, comports him, himself. Not as good as they are, sir. They still have something to learn. Every morning from this day forward, you will brief us on your instructional plans in writing. And nothing will change without my express approval. Including the hard deck, sir? Especially the hard deck, Captain. It's mystifying to somebody like my character looking at this guy's career and saying, like, what's, why aren't you running things? You should be me. You should be, you know, in a leadership position. And yet here you are still a captain. That pretty much sets the stage and, and, and tells you everything you need to know about our relationship. Uh, but it was great. I mean, to be able to, to be in those scenes with Tom Cruise uh, is a, you know, it's a lifelong dream, for real. You play it well, you've got the square jaw, and you have that good vibe of, I don't like you, but I need you up there. Man. Exactly, exactly. Energy. And that's there's so much of that that's baked into not only the, the story, but just the character of, of Maverick. I mean, he's it's right there in his in his name. He's, he's the Maverick. And and you, you, you know, you, you don't like him, but you want, you need him. And, and he is exactly that and 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 as the movie plays out you see you see how uh that comes to comes to bear fruit talking about tom cruise and maverick i think part of why this works so well is because he is still maverick 
32 years since the original movie. He looks great. He's in shape. He still carries it. What was it like to be on set with him as sort of the leader? I, I'll never forget movie? my first day on set. Like I walked onto set. We're at North Island Naval Base in Coronado, San Diego. I'm looking around. It's basically a temple to Top Gun. There's a two-story American flag for the set. Everybody's in, you know, gear. And I walk on the set and there's Tom Cruise and he just looks at me and he's, hey, he comes up, gives me a big hug. It's so good to have you here. We're so excited. I was like, are you kidding me? This is insane. I said to him at some point during that day, that first day, I was like, this has to be like an out of body experience for you. You are in the same wardrobe on the same set and it's 30 years later. Like what is, you were 25 or whatever he was when he was making that movie the first time. I was like, what does that feel like? He goes, I feel like I'm at home. Your reputation precedes you. I have to admit, I wasn't expecting an invitation back. They're called orders, Maverick. And he is that guy, isn't he? I mean, you've talked about him of sets the tone for the set. Here's how hard we're going to work. Here's when we're going to work. First guy in, last guy out. Everything you want him to be, he is. And he, he knows it. He knows he has to be. And so he, he's, he's never late. He's never in a bad mood. He's happy to be there. He's happy to make movies. He's a movie star. Good morning, aviators. This is your captain speaking. He is the best. It's a, it's a rare thing to be like in the presence of a guy like that, that movie star energy. That's yes. Just, it's, and it's, it's infectious and it's fun and it's uh, unique. I'll say that. And a wild thing to be standing in a scene with somebody whose like poster was on the wall of yeah, your childhood. Yeah, exactly. Right. Exactly. <laughs> I you pinch yourself, and it's uh, yeah, it doesn't happen often, but boy, is it fun when it does. The Today Show's newest fan. Al Roker. Allie Jackson now. Weekdays at 5 on NBC News Now. The day's biggest political stories with trusted insight now and expert analysis now. A daily look at the politics behind the headlines. Meet the Press Now, streaming weekdays at 4 p.m. on NBC News Now. Live from Ukraine, from Uvalde, Texas, from Mayfield, Kentucky. To cover the news, you have to be in it. This is how so many towns and cities are protecting themselves. You can actually see they're pushing the gates open. Was there a school officer on campus? That's what we've been told. No. Do you remember any tornado as bad as this one? You look at this and you're thinking, we're not going to have power for weeks, if not months. Exactly. Every night, it's your news playlist. Top Story with Tom Yamas, weeknights at 7 on NBC News Now. These days, it feels like the news never stops. So let's get into it. What's happening right now? What it all means for you for an hour every day? It can be hard to keep up, so let's get started together. Hallie Jackson Now, weekdays at 5 on NBC News Now. Now tonight with Joshua Johnson, streaming weeknights at 8 on NBC News Now. Hallie Jackson Now, weekdays at 5 on NBC News Now. These days, it feels like the news never stops. So let's get into it. What's happening right now? What it all means for you for an hour every day? It can be hard to keep up, so let's get started together. Hallie Jackson Now, weekdays at 5 on NBC News Now. You got to stay on solid ground for your role. Yes, I did. But my God, some of the fighter plane scenes. And Tom says we had to test all these actors and make sure they could pull eight yeah. Gs. There's no real camera trick. There's a little, of course, but like, they're flying in those planes. You're seeing what you see. It's not, uh, that's no joke. That's no CGI. It's real. And those guys and girls all had to go through pretty much fighter pilot training. You know, they're in G suits. They're experiencing G lock, loss of consciousness. You know, basically, you're pulling so much gravity that the blood is going out of your head. It's literally, it's, yeah. that's literally what happens. Yeah. Like the, it's, and, and, you see it on screen like you see their faces like moving in, in that way and it's it is a uh, 
it's exciting. Your your pulse immediately starts ramping up when you see it, and it's uh, it's because it's real. And if you had a chance to sit and watch the watch the movie, yeah, I, I've seen the whole film. It's, and your reaction was what? I I literally I I got misty. Yeah. You know, I I definitely was reminded of like being that young kid and watching that first one. There's there's a couple things I won't I won't spoil, but there's some uh, some characters we've seen before that mm. come back uh, and remind you that like oh wow that, like these characters and these relationships are are seemingly ongoing since you know yeah. since we left off in 1985, um, and then I was just blown away by the by the storytelling and the and how it's told the the, the camera work and the the uh, action sequences are unbelievable and I'm just happy to be a part of it a lot has changed in all of our lives but some of these things are still in place do you know what i mean like, yeah for oh, sure okay there's maverick and there's all these other characters that you're alluding to and it feels good to see yeah, it it does it, there, there's something very comfortable about that um and i think we've all had you know a very interesting last couple of years too of uncertainty and yeah. things feeling like what's what's normal what's real what's and then something like this happens this is an actual big time movie it's not a streamer it's not a this it's not a binge it's a it's a movie it's an event movie that are the kinds of things that we used to do when yeah. we were 13 14 15 years old i remember my first experience with something like that i, I certainly saw top gun at least four times in the theater because you had to yeah. you just wanted to do it again um and that's i think gonna happen with this i think people are going to see this and then immediately want to see it again there's also been a little bit of the waiting game for this, building up this anticipation. Tell you shot it. this, I think, four years <laughs> yes, ago or something like that? in 2018. 2018. Uh, the movie was finished in 2019. It was meant to come out in 2020. Obviously, the world, you know, stopped and we had to put a pause on it. But the, you know, the idea was this needs to be seen big and loud and on a big screen and to blow your hair back. And that's the way it's going to be seen. And I... I I challenge anybody to to not be blown away by the film. What was the first phone call back to St. Louis like to your buddies who saw the movie with you in 86 and you said, I'm going to be in the new <laughs> Top Gun with Tom Cruise? Well, mostly I think it, it, there was an announcement in, you know, whatever in the press. So I got a lot of incoming calls of like, <laughs> is this real? Are you in this movie? You know, yeah, yeah, yeah. Before I'd shot a frame, before I'd been on set, before I went to costume fitting anything like what's the deal well i can't really talk about it but yeah it was pretty uh across the board you know full-blown excitement uh and I, i'm still to this you know every time a trailer drops or anything comes out i can't wait to see this movie i can't wait to see this movie L literally i got an email from a friend of mine who was uh the younger brother of a kid i played baseball with and, and went to high school with who like bought a t-shirt he's like <laughs> ready to go <laughs> this is a grown man by yeah. the way this yeah. is a 40 year old man sure like, yeah <laughs> bought a t-shirt and is ready to go there's gonna be a lot of that you yeah. gotta get ready i know Which i was telling you my 12 year old son is very excited about this and uh -huh. he watched the old one have you thought about like oh this is gonna be a movie for those kids the way it was for us Just yeah this sort of extension of this for sure i mean world. It's, it's like we were talking about it's there's a quality to certain films that makes them sort of blockbusters right so there's this is one of those things this is one of those movies that it's not an academy award movie it's not a prestige movie this is a blockbuster and it's for kids of a certain age it will be memorable in a way that will be uh you know super specific but also just mind-blowing for them and i think you know it's it's hard for me to to soft pedal it, I can't. It's just, it is what it is. It's going to be awesome. And that's how it's designed. It's meant to be awesome. And uh, yeah, I can't. I just can't wait for people to see it. It's amazing how ingrained that movie, the first movie is. When I was watching it back with my son the other night, I knew every frame almost that was coming. And despite the fact I haven't seen it in years, every pull of a cigar, every line, every cut of music, just kind of becomes a part of the, the well, conscience. Well, yeah, Tony Scott did an amazing thing with that first film. Like, every shot is sunset, yeah. everything, you know, it doesn't make any sense. <laughs> it's like, you know, how is it always sunset? Right. Like, wait, <laughs> does the sun ever move? No. But but just the 
the vocabulary of it, all the all the guys in the helmets that yeah. are that are doing all the things that are launching the planes and all the stuff, and and it's it's so redolent of that first film, this one that we did, and Joe Kozanski, who, who directed it, is again strikes the exact balance of homage to Tony's you know kind of vocabulary visually and stuff. There's there's the music cues that you mentioned, all of that stuff, and yet it's it's so of you know twenty. 20, 2021, 2022 now, uh, of the now that it has its own life. And it's, uh, it's just great. It's, it's, uh, it's amazing. They, we, there's a couple scenes in like the, the pilot bar that they, they rebuilt this. They built it out of, from scratch, this bar. It looks like it's been there for a hundred years, but they built it from scratch so much so that the Navy was like, can we keep this? (laughs) It's a good bar. (laughs) It's great. Yeah. Right on the beach. Yeah. Nothing works. There's there's no, there's no water running water or anything. We're like, can we keep this? Sure. (laughs) Connect it up. Yeah. (laughs) Now, how'd you avoid the beach scene? The shirtless uh, football game. Oh, I don't, nobody wants to see that. Thank God. (laughs) I didn't have to. Watching the, watching the, the young kids working out for about two, two and a half weeks before that. I was like, enjoy. I'm I'm going to go get dinner. I'll be in my uniform. You guys, yeah, I'll be in my uniform <laughs> and sunglasses. Well, congrats, man. It's such such a good film. Thank you. People are going to absolutely love it, if, whether you're 12 or our age or it older. It is it's for awesome. all ages. It's so good. Hi, I'm Savannah Guthrie. And I'm Hoda Kotb. Do you want the top stories in news, pop culture, celebrity interviews, cooking, and more all in one place? We got the channel for you. Check out our 24-7 streaming channel today all day and make the most of your day. NBC News, streaming free now. These days, it feels like the news never stops. So let's get into it. What's happening right now, what it all means for you for an hour every day. It can be hard to keep up, so let's get started together. Allie Jackson Now, weekdays at 5 on NBC News Now. To cover the news, you have to be in it. This is how so many towns and cities are protecting themselves. They're pushing the gates open. Was there a school officer on campus? That's what we've been told. No. Top Story with Don Yamas. Weeknights at 7 on NBC News Now. News is happening now. Are you ready? Look at what's making headlines around the world. Right now on Morning News Now. We're coming on the air with breaking news. And this is a significant moment. Whenever it happens, wherever you are, NBC News, streaming free now. News is happening now. To look at what's making headlines around the world. We're coming on the air with breaking news. This is a significant moment. Whenever it happens, wherever you are, NBC News, streaming free now. Now tonight with Joshua Johnson, streaming weeknights at 8 on NBC News Now. For breaking news in our changing world, download the NBC News app. For breaking news in our changing world, download the NBC News app. Now tonight with Joshua Johnson, streaming weeknights at 8 on NBC News Now. For breaking news in our changing world, download the NBC News app. I do want to ask you about Fletch. Yes. Confess Fletch. I was doing the research and I said, is this the same Fletch as I grew up with? And the answer is yes. Yes and no. So how did this come about? It's, uh, well, Gregory McDonald wrote about 12 books uh, throughout the 70s and 80s uh, starring our man Fletch. And as you and I both know, and anybody that's grew, that grew up in the 80s knows, Chevy's uh, version of Fletch became very popular and iconic, if you'll use, if I can overuse that word again. Um, and and uh, yet there are these other stories. And so it's been threatened to be rebooted for years and years and years. And finally, um, Miramax, who had the, who had the rights said, well, we're doing this. Do you want to, do you want to do this? And I said, yes, I do. I really do. And of course the, the danger of in doing anything like that, rebooting anything like that is like, okay, well, what are you going to do? Are you going to imitate right. Chevy? Like, no, you can't. Chevy's Chevy. So we had to really kind of, we approached it like a cover song. Like you think, mm. okay, well, you're not going to play it exactly the same way. 
you have to kind of come up with your own spin on it. And so that's what we did. And Greg Matola, who I've worked with on several projects, is a wonderful filmmaker and a good friend. And we, we decided, okay, well, we're going to take it in a little bit of a different way. We're going to get back to kind of the, what the books were, more of a straight kind of who done it, and and really kind of lean into that and, and less on the jokey wigs and teeth right. and funny voices and all that stuff, which is great, and but is very much of Chevy's version. So we made a very cool, jazzy, interesting, uh, more adult kind of version of it. And, and hopefully we'll get to make a lot more. We'll see what happens. So we're going to wait to see who is going to release it. Um, but I'm excited for people to see that too, because we, we, my, my friend John Slattery's in it with me. Um, uh, Kyle McLaughlin. We have we've got, we've got a lot of uh, Marsha Gay Harden. We've got a lot of cool people in it. It's really funny and it's really fun. Uh, it takes it takes place in Boston and then Rome. Um, so it's kind of got you know it's got a little international flavor to it. And we're hoping to be able to make a few more of those too. I'm sure the first thing you have to do is get Chevy's version out of your head, right? Yeah, because yeah. it's there for all of us. For sure. Yeah. For sure. It's it's you know it's a different it's a different take on it. So I'm I'm hoping people get to see that as well coming up in the in the next year or so, and yeah, and then we'll make some more of them. I cannot wait to see that either. You're on a roll, man. I'm doing what I can. You really are. You are. <laughs> it does seem like post Mad Men, everyone's gotten to see how funny you are, which your friends have always known about you. Is that a conscious thing of like 30 Rock and Kimmy and Curb and all the... And now- I got really lucky. I'll say this because, you know, obviously doing something like Mad Men, which is so serious and so specific. Um, and I'll credit Lorne Michaels. Like he was, he was the guy who said, come do the show. Come do SNL. Come do it three times. Come do it, you know, whenever you want. Now, before I was cast as the uh, mysterious debonair Don Draper, I did a bunch of stuff. Um, for example, in the early 90s, I had a guest spot on the teen sitcom Late for Class. <laughs> I, uh, I played the new kid at school, Bonzo. Uh, I think we have a clip of it. Uh, check it out. Oh no, I forgot about the quiz. You better not cheat off me, Trevor. Hey, Bonzo, did you hear? We have a quiz in geography. Lower your voice. (laughs) Show a little respect. Panic every time there's a quiz as if it really matters. And go through life like a cockroach in the dirt. You people make me sick. That was the person that gave me the intro to Tina Fey on 30 Rock. And that was what got me Kimmy Schmidt and then, you know, introduced me to Larry David and and that whole world. So I'm tremendously lucky to be able to play on both sides of the aisle. Uh, And, and, uh, and I'm, yeah, I'll, I'll, I give all credit to, to Lauren Michaels for that. Is it fun to step into those worlds? For sure. And show off like, you saw Don For Draper, sure. you saw all that stuff, but here I am this way. Well, and getting to meet and work with people like Kristen Wiig on Bridesmaids or, or Bill <laughs> Hader on Barry or whatever, you know, it's like there's so many phenomenally talented people that come through that building, you know, uh, and, and to get a chance to, to work with them um, is is great. I was watching you in Bridesmaids this morning where you go, I really want you to leave. <laughs> That was a that was a fun one. That was so, a fun one. It's so good. Live from Ukraine, from Uvalde, Texas, from Mayfield, Kentucky. To cover the news, you have to be in it. This is how so many towns and cities are protecting themselves. You can actually see they're pushing the gates open. Was there a school officer on campus? That's what we've been told. No. Do you remember any tornado as bad as this one? You look at this and you're thinking, we're not going to have power for weeks, if not months. Exactly. Every night. It's your news playlist. Top Story with Tom Yamas. Weeknights at 7 on NBC News Now. Hallie Jackson Now. Weekdays at 5 on NBC News Now. Now Tonight with Joshua Johnson. Streaming weeknights at 8 on NBC News Now. This is a critical choke point for this fire. And good evening from New Orleans. Nice to really spend some time with you. Appreciate it.
cover the news, you have to be in it. This is how so many towns and cities are protecting themselves. They're pushing the gates open. Was there a school officer on campus? That's what we've been told. No, top story with Tom Yamas. Weeknights at 7 on NBC News Now. Now tonight with Joshua Johnson. Streaming weeknights at 8 on NBC News Now. Mad Men's been off the air for seven years now, I yeah, think. That's right. You've got some distance from it. Have you been able to process what a whirlwind that was well, and what an impact it had on your life? Yes, yeah, for sure. We, we just lost an all-star in Bobby Morse this week. Yeah. Working with him and kind of thinking back to what a career that that man had. And the funny thing for me is like, I see Kiernan Shipka every now and again. Mm -hmm. And she's now 22 years old. Yeah. And when I started working with her, she was six. So it's literally like that is marking the passage of time for me. It's like, okay, this person, she's going to get married. She's going to have kids like this crazy yeah. like whirlwind. I've known you since you were six. It's, you know, she played my daughter, but it feels like she is my daughter. It's very strange. But yeah, getting, getting that distance from it has been fun, honestly. Like it's, it's fun to look back on, on that show and, and be reminded of what a great thing we made. I, I got a lovely text from a, a friend of mine, Annie Clark, also known as St. Vincent, mm -hmm. uh, uh, the other day who said, I was just on an airplane and I was watching the show. And yeah. it, just, it, was, it was so, it's so good, it's so good. I get one of those every two, three months from somebody. And it's, it's a good reminder. Yeah, we made, we made something great. And uh, not a lot of people can say that. And it's important when you, when you, you have done something like that to, to remember it. It's kind of, that was 2007 when it started. And people forget we hadn't been in the streaming world and all that. We yeah. had Sopranos and The Wire and a few of those shows. The show was great, but there was no guarantee it was going to take off. We no. shot the pilot in 2005, I think, or 2006. And then it was a year before we shot the second one. We didn't yeah. know if we were going to get picked up. Right. We didn't know if we were going to make a second episode. So then it then it debuted and it was a hit. People were gaga for it, which is great. But we didn't know if we were going to get a second season. You know, it was that kind of thing. It was very, we'll see, we'll see, we'll see. AMC didn't really have a history of, of making television. Right. They weren't really sure the funding. They were trying to figure out how to finance this thing. It was not an inexpensive show to make. It was period. It took place in New York City, even though we're shooting in LA. We build all these sets. So it was very, you know, piecemeal and how it came together. And then once it finally did and we achieved the kind of critical mass of, 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 you know, critics and all the, all the other stuff. Okay. We started winning awards. Okay. Here it is. Now we're Emmy award winning and, and all the other stuff. Well, but okay. Now we're going to get another, now we're going to get another mm. season. Mm. Might not get two more seasons, but we'll see. And then all of a sudden it went for seven seasons and that's, that's a success that very few people get to experience. And, and we're, I'm eternally grateful for it, but it's a unicorn in a lot of ways. It obviously changed your career, but it changed your life too. I remember seeing you at the 2012, one of the political conventions in, in Charlotte. And we were in the lobby of a hotel's group of people and someone came up and asked for a picture with you, height of Mad Men. And you turned in one person and it was this thing. <laughs> And I went, wow, that's like a different way to go through life. It was a change. It's certainly a change. It's definitely, you think like, and politics is a perfect way to put it because I remember meeting Al Gore at one point and he said, you know, the, the selfies have taken five years out of my life. Mm. Just because in the old days, you shake hands and move on. That's yeah. it. Maybe you get a little Purell. That's all you got to worry yeah. about. And now it's a it's a picture, it's a this, it's a let's do. And of course you don't want to be, you know, rude. Yeah. But there's also, you know, there's all, only so many minutes in the day. And you talk about that thing where it's like it's one person and then it's two people. Now and it's then okay it's 3, one thousand got it. Yeah. Yeah. And your rest of your day is in that That's lobby. The rest of your day. Yeah. But you seems to me you've sort of managed it pretty well, right? You've had that moment and but you live regularly. You I think, you know, I think like you learn to prioritize everything, right? So yeah. everything has its compartment. And like, if you're, if you're going into a place where you know that's part of the equation, then you have to kind of dial that up. And if you, you can, you can remove yourself from those things. But if you go to Madison Square Garden, you're gonna get yeah. 
you're going to get mobbed. That's yeah. the way it is. So, you know, you just got to manage those expectations. So what do you have on the, we've got Fletch coming, Top Gun, Maverick's going to be huge. As you look at the sort of future and the horizon of your career, what's still out there that you want to do? Yeah, and I don't know. Um, I've been so lucky, you know, I've been so fortunate to, to do, like I said, to work on both sides of the aisle, comedy and drama, work with all this, all the people that I want to work with. My, my friend John Slattery just made a movie starring me and Tina Fey. We shot that last fall. That's going to come out at some point. Um, I don't know. I, I'm just, I just like to keep my, my, my head on a swivel and my eyes open and, and be aware when those opportunities come my way that I don't miss them. Well, it's guided you pretty well, right? So far, so Wouldn't good. You say? Yeah. Congratulations on everything. Thanks. People are going to freak out about Top I think It's I think, so good. I think, I think they're going to like it. Good to see you, man. Good to see you. And welcome to your Wednesday Pop Star Plus. I'm Joe Fryer in for Carson, who's taking a little recovery time after back surgery. Coming up on today's show, the one and only Tyler Perry. He's written and directed a new film and gave us all the details. Then your rom-com fix with the film Wedding Season. And later on in our show, get ready Star Wars fans, we found a clip from the 1977 cast. But first, Chanel has today's Pop Star. First up, Saturday Night Live. Yesterday, we talked about the show's changing cast heading into the new season. Well, now we know the celebrity lineup who will be hosting oh. the season premiere. Do you want to see? Yes. 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 Here yes. we go. Kicking off the first episode is Top Gun Maverick star Miles Teller. Okay. Uh, he'll take the stage next Saturday with musical oh, guest Kendrick wow. Lamar. Okay. On October 8th, Irish actor Brendan Gleeson, who you oh. might recognize from movies like Harry Potter yeah. and Troy, makes his SNL debut along with singer Willow Smith. Wow. And on October 15th, Meg Thee Stallion is pulling double duty as both host and musical guest. Wow. Again, you can catch season 48 starting October 1st right here. Season on 48. NBC. Just That's think season about that for a 48. second. Yeah. Twice as long as Roger Federer. <laughs> there you go. Talk about longevity. And lots of new faces this year, mm. so it should be good. All right, next up, Brad Pitt. How about this? He's an actor, mm -hmm. a producer, and an artist. Huh? For the first time ever, the Oscar winner is sharing some of his artwork. This is at the Sarah Hilden Art Museum in Finland. His sculptures are part of an exhibit that also features pieces by musician Nick Cave. And this week, Pitt spoke with a Finnish broadcaster about the meaning behind his debut pieces. For me, it's, it, it was born out of ownership of, of, of really what I call a, a radical inventory of self, getting really brutally honest with me and where we're um, taking account of, of those I may have hurt or, and those I, you know, in, in moments I've just gotten wrong. So many questions. He's so an actor and he's questions. a creative. Well, you know, people emotional. like to create. And so like. you have to find a space to do that. Even if you go to Finland, you've got to do really it, right? He sounds really introspective. Yeah. More introspective so, than I've ever heard. So of. I don't know if you saw those pictures there. The collection includes a molded plaster panel. It's mm -hmm. illustrating a gunfight. And then a clear house-shaped sculpture. It shows a bullet's trajectory. So his pieces will be on display through January. Okay. There you go. And finally, Savannah and Hoda. Take a mm. peek inside the latest edition of Us Weekly, and you'll find out what it's like to live a day in the life. Come on, get up. Today, <laughs> Savannah, Hoda, this feature is a timeline from one of your days right after the Queen died. Do you remember this part of it? Have you had well, a chance to see it? Well, that was actually quite a wild day, wasn't it? We started the show. We thought we had, we, were, we, we did the NFL watch party, but then I ran off to London. We had, we had so a photo many, shoot. We had so many things planned that, that day. day. It got, yeah, and everything mm. got turned upside down, so they kind of followed us along on our two we had kind of parallel paths we mm. had a couple things together savannah ran to the airport and but that's a day in the life that's yeah. a day yeah. in the life that's it was what happened it was fun it yeah. was really fun Congrats. yeah 
And we have some more headlines for you. We're missing Carson around here while he recovers from back surgery, but we're keeping up with him on season 22 of The Voice. Round two of blind auditions is kicked off, and the competition is already getting pretty fierce. Peyton Aldridge got three of the four judges to spin their chairs during his performance of Can't You See? And in an attempt to win over the Mississippi-based singer, John actually hopped on stage for a little duet. Check this out. And you give me all of you. Oh. John also happened to throw down his block card on Team Blake, prompting Shelton to make this impassioned plea to sway Aldridge over to Team Gwen. You did have a great moment there with John singing, and it was very special. But what would really have him talking tomorrow morning on the Today Show would be if after that moment happened, then you chose Gwen Stefani yeah, so to be your coach. And you'd be like, oh my gosh, Don't I can't believe him. he did that. Don't encourage him, people. Don't forget about the Today Show. We are talking about it on Today, but Blake, your master plan was only half a success. We're talking about it, but he did indeed go with Team Legend. All right, finally, Billy Eichner, the hilarious man on the street comedian, brought back his hit series, Billy on the Street, for a special edition episode to promote his new movie, Bros. And even after a three-year hiatus, Eichner easily slipped right back into his beloved on-screen persona, running up to unsuspecting New Yorkers and accosting them on the sidewalk. Plus, he had a little help from an Avenger. Miss Paul Rudd and I are rounding up straight women to go see bros! Oh my God! Go see bros! Miss for a dollar, will you be seeing bros? Will you see bros? I'm sorry. Why, why? I'm sorry. I'm sorry I'm not Florence Pugh! My new movie, Bros. You ready for Somehow Billy makes every New Yorker's nightmare of being approached by a stranger actually seem kind of fun. We're keeping our eyes peeled for you, Billy. And those are your Pop Star Plus headlines. Still ahead, Tyler Perry on his new film. He wrote and directed it. Don't go anywhere. Live from Ukraine, from Uvalde, Texas, from Mayfield, Kentucky. To cover the news, you have to be in it. This is how so many towns and cities are protecting themselves. You can actually see they're pushing the gates open. Was there a school officer on campus? That's what we've been told. No. Do you remember any tornado as bad as this one? You look at this and you're thinking, we're not going to have power for weeks, if not months. Exactly. Every night, it's your news playlist. Top Story with Tom Yamas. Weeknights at 7 on NBC News Now. These days, it feels like the news never stops. So let's get into it. What's happening right now, what it all means for you for an hour every day. It can be hard to keep up, so let's get started together. Hallie Jackson Now, weekdays at 5 on NBC News Now. Top Story with Tom Yamas, weeknights at 7 on NBC News Now. Today is now a podcast, available every morning. Listen wherever you get your podcasts. Now tonight with Joshua Johnson, streaming weeknights at 8 on NBC News Now. News is happening now. To look at what's making headlines around the world. We're coming on the air with breaking news. This is a significant moment. Whenever it happens, wherever you are, NBC News, streaming free now. NBC News, streaming free now. Welcome back to Pop Star Plus. Tyler Perry's latest project is a film set in the late 1930s and 40s of Hopewell, Georgia. A jazz man's blues chronicles a tale of star-crossed lovers. And fun fact, it's based on a script that Perry actually wrote 27 years ago. He stopped by Studio 1A to fill us in on it. Tyler Perry, good morning. Good morning. We love the fact this was something you wrote. You were a kid when you wrote this, 27 years ago. I'm about 26 years old, yeah, yeah. You're 26 years old. You put it in a drawer. You put it away. What made you decide, let me dust that off. Let me see if now's the time for Just it. Just watching what's, you know, I, I had to be strategic in what I was doing before, so I had to make sure I had hit after hit after hit. So this yeah. one I wanted to just take my time and do it at the right moment. But watching what's happening in our society where the banning of books, the watering down of history of black people in America, yeah. the homogenizing of slavery and Jim Crow. So I wanted to tell this story, and I thought now's the time. 
It's huh. a love story, but it's mm -hmm. also a story that does raise all of those issues. Yeah, yeah. When I think about you 27 years ago, 26 mm -hmm. years old, where were you in your mm -hmm. life when you wrote this? Struggling and broken. I, had, I got an opportunity. What I would do if, if I wanted to see a show, I would sneak in at intermission when everybody came out to smoke at the theater. Mm -hmm. So I went into the Alliance Theater and I saw an August Wilson play. I think it was Two Trains Running at the time. Mm -hmm. And I met him afterwards and he was so encouraging. He said, you know, write what's in your heart. And I went home and started writing Jazz Man. And it all poured out of me. Mm -hmm. You yeah. know, it's like when you look at these actors, I'm surprised I, they're not household names. They're so good at what they do. But you found people who who were uh, relatively new to the business, people who we don't know yet. Yeah, my, and my hope is that they become household names because they are brilliant yeah. in these performances. And I'm so proud of Josh and Solea and Austin. I can go mm -hmm. down the list of everybody. Mm -hmm. Amira, Moana, I can go every, everybody. But I, I just wanted, uh, I look back at what I've done in the past and I was always at the forefront of uh, launching or helping new mm -hmm. talent. You know, from a very young Idris Elba's first movie to Viola Davis working with me very <laughs> early on. on. So, you got so an eye for talent. I'm, yeah. so, I'm, hoping they, I'm hoping they have the same results. You know, I, I hear that you don't read reviews. No, no <laughs> But I, I know that you know that this has received good reviews because none other than your friend Oprah called <laughs> yeah, you. Yeah. And did she really, she read one of these beautiful reviews what, to you? Yeah, she, the Variety review. She said, listen, um, did you see it? I was like, no, I just, I can't let any of that in. I just, no, it's really, you read, I was like, no, no, no. She said, I'm going to read it. No, 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 okay, oh. you read it. No, I'm reading it to you on the phone. She read She read the review on the phone oh. and got emotional halfway through it because she was, she's just so, Oprah's just so happy for me. Why is she moment. so proud of you? Yeah. I, I think it's just, it's just a genuine thing because I've known her for 18 years now and she's watched my growth through all of this and she's just such a wonderful person. You said back when you you were 26, you were broke. You were just mentioning to Savannah. And I remember listening to you. I don't know whether it was an interview with me or something you mm -hmm. said, but I remember it so vividly. You lived in New Orleans and you said when you were younger, you used to drive down like St. Charles Avenue mm -hmm. where there are beautiful homes when you didn't have any money because you wanted to see where you were going to live. Yeah. And you would go to parking lots where they were selling cars and you wanted to get behind the wheel of like a Mercedes because you wanted to feel the car well, that you were going to drive. Tell me about that idea. You had to see yeah. before you could actually have. Exposure. It's exposure, like the understanding of that I can have these things, that this is possible because other people have it. Why can't I? And it wasn't necessarily about the material things as much as it was about the idea of dreaming and touching and feeling. I think just having exposure to things around the world has changed my entire outlook on yeah. so much. And I think that if more of us could, we would just be people that could evolve into understanding more cultures and people and, and respecting each other. So exposure is really important. I'm not talking about Mercedes in the house. I'm talking <laughs> yeah, about just yeah, yeah. exposure life, in life. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah, yeah, where sure. did that belief come from? Yeah. Because, I mean, it's deep within you, yeah. mm -hmm. even in your darkest day, even yeah. with mm -hmm. all of the difficulties of your childhood, which mm -hmm. you've talked about. Deep down, you knew, yeah. mm -hmm. it seems. Yeah. You knew you were headed for great things. I, well, I, I was very, very hopeful, but but my mother took me to church every Sunday. My my I, uh, grandfather was a minister. I went to seminary school for a while as a mm -hmm. teenager. So I had this, I've always had this tremendous deep faith and I just always believed that things will work out. And mm. to be in this place and feel it and see it working out and it inspiring so many other people. That's what I was gonna I say. Love it. It's yeah. like the paying yeah. forward piece mm -hmm. of your life that I'm so into too. Yeah. It's like you're on top of the mountain and you're like, you come up here with me, you come up here with me. Like that's what you're, that's what you're doing. I don't feel like it's that selective <laughs> as much as I feel like there are people who, like even at the studio, people, I have people who are working for me who have been in jail for 6, 12, 20 years, and they come out, they're in the grip and electric department, and the whole studio is just people coming in, the eyes wider than anything you can it. imagine. I love it. Never having a chance to to have these kind of opportunities, yeah. so it's awesome. And you're giving the shot. That's Thank you. We love you, by the way, Tyler. I love we people. really do. We do. You're just so inspiring and so proud of you. This yeah. is an amazing, amazing project. Thank you. 27 years in the making, but right on time. Yeah, it's thank you. We should mention you can find a jazz man's blues on Netflix. Coming up, we're diving into the rom-com wedding season. Stay with us. Today is now a podcast available every morning. Listen wherever you get your podcasts. This is a critical choke point for this fire. And good evening from New Orleans. Nice to really spend some time with you. Appreciate it. Top Story with Tom Yamas. Weeknights at 7 on NBC News Now.
These days, it feels like the news never stops. So let's get into it. What's happening right now, what it all means for you for an hour every day. It can be hard to keep up, so let's get started together. Allie Jackson Now, weekdays at 5 on NBC News Now. For breaking news in our changing world, download the NBC News app. The day's biggest political stories with trusted insight now and expert analysis now. A daily look at the politics behind the headlines. Meet the Press Now, streaming weekdays at 4 p.m. on NBC News Now. NBC News, streaming free now. For breaking news in our changing world, download the NBC News app. These days, it feels like the news never stops. So let's get into it. What's happening right now, what it all means for you for an hour every day. It can be hard to keep up, so let's get started together. Hallie Jackson Now, weekdays at 5 on NBC News Now. Hallie Jackson Now, weekdays at 5 on NBC News Now. Today is now a podcast, available every morning. Listen wherever you get your podcasts. We're back here on Popstar Plus. Have you ever needed a wedding date so badly you thought about pretending to date someone? Well, that's actually what happens in the film Wedding Season. And Donna Farrison spoke to its stars about the story and how it highlights South Asian storytelling. I'm really excited for the two of you. I want to get right into wedding season. Did this movie hit close to home for you two? Definitely after we shot the film, I started to notice things more. I was like, oh, yeah, people are getting married. People are stressed about this stuff. Like A lot of my friends are now married. All my, most of my exes from a previous lifetime are all married. I went to four That's weddings huge. in the last five months. I know the feeling. Yeah. Four weddings in the last five months. Four weddings in the last, all Indian weddings, all crazy. Pallavi, how would you describe wedding season? I would describe it as a lens, as a really beautiful lens into one aspect of a very broad archetype that is South Asian culture as it exists in, you know, diasporic communities. And as I said, as a lens through which we can create intercultural understanding and empathy. I think as someone who grew up Indian Australian, I'm very cognizant of the fact that we're often expected to be obedient and compliant and quiet in the face of the host society, so to speak. And I think that wedding season is incredibly empowering as far as a woman who takes up space and starts to believe that she is able to do that within her family, within her personal relationships, within the workplace. Yeah, I just think it's like a, it's a beacon. It's a beacon for what we ought to be able to do in terms of living through love and not fear. Ravi. Literally the only reason I agreed to meet you here was so that my mom would stop posting my profile online. Mm -hmm. So this, us. Oh, is never gonna happen. Never gonna happen. How can you be so sure of that? Because our parents set this up. What drew you to your roles and how similar are you to your characters? Well, what drew me to Asha is many things i will say first of all the film as a whole i think has a really important part to play in the conversation around you know breaking down the binary of us and them in you know the modern lexicon of what it is to exist in society and i think that this film goes a long way towards the actualization of this idea that we are all one and it just is by shining a light on the normalcy of a family who lives in Jersey, who happens to be Indian um, or American of Indian origin. And then Asha's just a cool cat. She's a maverick, just like me. <laughs> and for me, it was just like finding a project where you're suddenly surrounded by South Asians in the creative space. Mm. That just rarely ever happens. It, it never happens. If you're of any minority and you're, let's just say an actor for now, you find yourself feeling quite alone you're like all right i'm doing this alone again you know to suddenly realize the bigger picture and how many people have given their souls and life to this is 
a joy and getting to work on this specifically on this project was a dream and obviously with her it was fun it was a learning yeah, experience fun. yeah yeah if we join forces we won't have to deal with all of this i'm not interested in a pretend relationship okay do this for your parents at least until wedding season is over what was it like bringing this experience you know to life and this project to life behind the scenes for you Oh my goodness. It was, you know, first of all, I guess if I actually now sit back and and look at the journey that I've been on and the fact that I dreamt of being an actress when I was a very I was probably 2 or 3 when I said I want to grow up and be an actress. And the actualization of that is kind of unbelievable even statistically speaking. So to be a part of that beginning phase is something that I think people like myself and Suraj have been working towards for a long time and now to have someone like yourself even recognize that and ask that question it just means that it's working and we are moving the needle forward and it's the work is being seen we are being seen we are representing others that will be seen and we break down the monolithic stereotypes of what it is to be a person of color of south asian descent on screen but also in the broader community mm-hmm. um and i think that's ultimately the aim of storytelling and one thing to that is that you know many times it's like okay wow you're a south asian actor like on screen you must really be changing things you know the real change happens behind the camera and then in front of the movie screen so in that regard this was a gem mm-hmm. being surrounded by all these south asians who have been at different stages in their lives mm-hmm. all with a common struggle and with this team behind it you know right off the bat there was intention with this mm-hmm. as intention and that hits deep well and and thinking about you know the authenticity of this storytelling and also in the representation the south asian representation behind the scenes and in front of the camera What do you hope audiences take away from this movie? Who is this movie for? Everyone. Everyone. <laughs> and if anything I want to be taken away is a little bit of understanding. Mm-hmm. It's like how am I supposed to accept or understand this group mm-hmm. if I've never communicated, if I don't have any insight into their lives, if I don't see the normal, see the common struggles? Yeah. It's through things like this. It's through conversation, mm-hmm. whether it be conversation through media, conversation in person. That's what. If I hope the people take away a lot of fun, because this is fun, and a little bit of understanding. Yeah. yeah, that's what breeds empathy. We should mention you can catch Wedding Season on Netflix. Up next from our vault, a Star Wars deep dive. Stick with us. to cover the news you have to be in it this is how so many towns and cities are protecting themselves they're pushing the gates open was there a school officer on campus that's what we've been told no top story with tom hamas we can have it at 7 on nbc news now news is happening now to look at what's making headlines around the world or coming on the air with breaking news this is a significant moment whenever it happens wherever you are nbc news streaming free now live from Ukraine from Uvalde, Texas, from Mayfield, Kentucky. To cover the news, you have to be in it. This is how so many towns and cities are protecting themselves. You can actually see they're pushing the gates open. Was there a school officer on campus? That's what we've been told. No, do you remember any tornado as bad as this one? You look at this and you're thinking we're not going to have power for weeks, if not months. Exactly. Every night, it's your news playlist. Top story with Tom Yamas. Weeknights at 7 on NBC News Now. Now tonight with Joshua Johnson, streaming weeknights at eight on NBC News Now. The day's biggest political stories with trusted insight now and expert analysis now. A daily look at the politics behind the headlines. Meet the press now, streaming weekdays at 4 p.m. on NBC News Now. For breaking news in our changing world, download the NBC News app. Welcome back. Mark Hamill, aka Luke Skywalker, turned 71 this weekend, and in his honor, we pulled an absolutely terrific clip from our vault. Here he is alongside Harrison Ford and the late great Carrie Fisher back in 1977 speaking about Star Wars as the film was first being released. With me are three stars of Star Wars. 
Carrie Fisher, who plays the princess, Mark Hamill, who plays the innocent and brave young hero, and Harrison Ford, the only movie actor named after two presidents, who is the dashing, daring space pilot who helps them all escape from danger. Good morning, all. Good, Good morning. morning. <laughs> is that nice to be named after two presidents? It's, it's never come up before. <laughs> <laughs> well, they're two of the most famous presidents in American history. I'm gratified. <laughs> Carrie, did you like playing? Is this your this is your first princess. lead? Your first princess. <laughs> yeah. Your first lead part. Yes, it is. Did you like doing it? A lot. We had a lot of fun doing it. Isn't it different from anything you're likely ever to do again? Because isn't most of the background put in afterwards, or all these process shots and animation? What did you play against very often? You three were you in blank studios where they put the background in later? Blue yeah, blue screen mostly. But, but the, th the thing that... I uh, mean, a big blank blue screen? Yeah, it looked like a big movie screen that was tinted blue. Uh, the thing is, it's, it, it wasn't any more difficult to imagine gigantic spaceships coming through than it is to drive in a mock-up car where you're being pulled by a truck and there's a... where you're supposed to see road and there's a, a, a camera crew and somebody doing the crossword and variety, <laughs> bored, you know, so... It was, it's all just using your imagination. For those who have not yet seen any of Star Wars, aside from what you are seeing right there, which is the kind of background that these three people played against. Harrison, why don't you tell us a little bit about a film clip we can now see. All right. Uh, a little episode from the film, and then we'll see it. All right. This is the escape from the Death Star. Mark and I and uh, Sir... Sir Alec is... Oh, dear, I'm beginning to get a little confused. We're, this is the escape from the Death Star. We have the princess. We've wrested her away from the evil forces of the Empire. And we're about to make, we make our escape, and they're following us. Okay, so now we are going to see a scene from Star Wars with lots of action. <laughs> Okay, stay sharp. Here they come. At that moment, in any theater where Star Wars is playing, the audience absolutely cheers. I have not seen, with the exception of Rocky, in the last few years, the kind of audience participation and audience reaction for and to a film that yeah. we have for Star Wars. It's great to sit in a theater and see people really enjoy something like that. Have you done it? Have you been? Yeah. Any of you? Oh, have you gone yes. to see a theater just oh, yeah. anonymously, just go in as a patron? It's sure. easy to be anonymous at this point, <laughs> really. Nobody recognizes us when we go into a theater, which is a pleasure, I must say. Nobody recognizes you? Just one guy who'd seen it uh, 12 times, <laughs> and he, he asked me What was his reaction? Out. He asked uh, you out? Yeah. The princess. No, I first told him that I was the prize, that the 20th Century Fox officer had heard he'd seen it 12 times, and he got 
a free date with the princess and a bucket of popcorn. Tickets punched, did you but he believed me. <laughs> <laughs> How'd you get this role? Um, mafia. It's a lot about the mafia, this film. No, no, no. How did you really get this role? <laughs> uh, well, George was seeing everybody that could walk into the office, so I could do that. And uh, I tested for it, and they mailed the test over to George, who was scouting locations in London, and... I got it. She's hired by mail, you see. <laughs> how, how do you do audition for a film in which most of your acting is in front of a blue screen? Unbelievable the way this came about. I wish I could say I walked in and he said, there's Luke Skywalker. I walked in, George was having joint interviews with Brian De Palma, who was casting Carrie. <laughs> <laughs> Every five minutes there, were, there, was, there was another person waiting just to talk. And we didn't, I never saw a script. I got five pages after that initial meeting in the mail. They said, memorize it, show up, you're going to test with this guy. And uh, believe me, I said, it was, it was never that George Lucas ever said, well, this is what we're going to do. This is kind of a, he said, let's just do it. And you knew George Lucas because you were in one of his other big hits, American Graffiti, and very yeah. good in that, I yeah. must say. You've been in two enormous popular successes. American Graffiti is one of the top 25 money makers, and yeah. this is going to be sky high, if you pardon the expression. Well, the name of the movie is Star Wars. It is going to be one of the biggest money-making movies of our time, no doubt about it, one of the big hits of the summer. And these are three of the non-robots <laughs> from Star Wars. A marvelous time capsule moment right there. You can find some amazing things in today's vault. Okay, everyone, that is another Pop Star Plus in the books. Hope you learned something new, and we'll see you right back here tomorrow. New York City is home to so many iconic foods, but when the city that never sleeps wakes up for breakfast, they want a bagel with a cream cheese schmear piled high with locks. There's no other city that makes a bagel like a New York City bagel. I have not had good bagels in any other city. I came out the wound eating bagels. It's time to head out of Studio 1A and hit the road for a new kind of culinary adventure. Follow me as I taste some of the most iconic foods around the country and meet the families behind them. Together, we're going to learn how a good meal has the power to connect us to our past, our future, and each other. If New York's known for anything, it's its bagels. And we got them all. Everything bagels, rainbow bagels, pumpkin bagels, croissant bagels, and of course you can't have them without a schmear. While the bagel first came from Poland, many food historians say its pairing with salmon and cream cheese originated right here in the Big Apple. In this town, few specialty food shops are as beloved and as historic as Russ and Daughters. I've been waiting in line probably 15, 20 minutes, but it's definitely worth it. I like the, the contrast of the flavor. It's like a nice little bagel with a with salty locks. I about the salmon and cream cheese together. Like I try to make it at home, but it's nothing compared to Russ and Daughters. They've been serving premium smoked fish to hungry New Yorkers and folks from around the world for over 100 years. Just a few blocks from the store is the Russ and Daughters Cafe. Hi, Al. Hey, Hi, Al. how are you? Welcome to the Russell Daughters Cafe. Nice to see it's you. Great guys. to have you here. Thanks for having us. This is beautiful. Thank you. Nikki Russ Fetterman and Josh Russ Tupper are the grandchildren of the original daughters. These cousins are fourth generation owners carrying on their family's culinary legacy. So this is Russ and Daughters. Wow. This is our great grandfather, Joel Russ, who started the business his wife, Bella, and his three daughters. Um, we, Josh and I have the same grandmother, and she was the youngest of the three. Was it unusual at that time for you, because you usually would see so-and-so and sons, yeah. but to see Russ and daughters. Very unusual. But I mean, honestly, if he'd had sons, it probably would have been Russ and sons. Well, thank like, goodness he did. We like exactly. to think of him as a feminist, but he was a good businessman. Joel Russ immigrated from Poland in 1907. And he started just standing on the streets of the Lower East Side selling schmaltz herring out of a barrel and a 
family could feed itself for two nights with one fish. In 1914, he opened his first brick and mortar shop, J. Russ National Appetizing. Joel and his wife had three daughters, Patty, Ida, and Anne. When they turned 11, each daughter began working with their dad. What was their relationship like with him? I, because uh, he's your dad, but he's also your boss. your boss. Yeah, and I think he cared more about being the boss and the shopkeeper. He was a new immigrant to this country who was just trying to survive and make a place for his family. And that was his focus. And he saw his children as, as you know, cheap labor. The sisters grew up learning all aspects of the business. In 1935, Hattie, Ida, and Anne became Joel's partners. The shop was renamed Russ and Daughters, making it the first in America to bear and daughters in its title. When your great-grandfather decided to, to start Russ and Daughters, why the Lower East Side? After Ellis Island, this was the starting off point for the majority of poor Jewish immigrants. This is where they landed and they got their start. And so he was just feeding basic food to other poor immigrants like himself. At the turn of the century, this neighborhood was one of the most densely populated places on the planet. Many immigrants from all around the world lived in overcrowded tenement buildings, the conditions having a profound impact on their diets. One of the things about Lower East Side Jewish food is that a lot of food wasn't made at home. When you don't have running water or when you don't have uh, electric or gas stoves, it's really hard to do very much cooking. And so for, for women who are responsible for feeding their families, they had to get food from push carts, from restaurants, from bakeries. Joel Russ was one of many vendors catering to this new population. I've, I've always been curious, how did it come about, or from what you've heard, that somebody thought, hey, you know, here's this round bread, we'll put some fish on it, but oh, by the way, before we do, let's put some cream cheese, some dairy on it. Yeah, first of all, Russ and Daughters is the torchbearer of what's called appetizing. And this is a food tradition born here in New York, and it's the sister food tradition to delicatessen, both of which come up through the Jewish kosher dietary rules. You have to separate fish and dairy from meat. So a delicatessen, strictly speaking, is for meat. The appetizing store is where you go for fish and dairy, things like herring, smoked fish, when we say bagel and lox, most people are, you know, we're referring to a smoked salmon. But sure. the original bagel and lox was not with smoked salmon. Technically, lox, or belly lox, is salmon cured in salt, which preserves fish without refrigeration. There's no smoking involved, and it's incredibly salty, so it pairs perfectly with tangy cream cheese. But who was the first person to put lox on a bagel? So no one really knows how bagels, lox, and cream cheese all came together. We know that bagels come from Eastern Europe. We know that lox kind of comes basically from Nova Scotia, kind of. We know the cream cheese is an American food. But what we know is that these things come together as part of a compromise between different generations of American Jews. Jewish law prohibits cooking with most heat sources on the Sabbath. So the combo of bagels and lox created a filling meal for observant Jews to enjoy on the day of rest. It's good for a family, but you or your daughter-in-law didn't have to be spending the, the previous day cooking. As one of the country's oldest appetizing stores, Russ and Daughters has been serving kosher meals for generations. And the weekends are still their busiest days. I can't think really of th anything that's more New York than lox and bagels. I agree. I think that this is a food that came up through the Eastern European Jewish immigrants to New York. But now it's it transformed and just become New York food. It belongs to all New Yorkers. Today is now a podcast, available every morning. Listen wherever you get your podcasts.
These days, it feels like the news never stops. So let's get into it. What's happening right now, what it all means for you for an hour every day. It can be hard to keep up, so let's get started together. Allie Jackson Now, weekdays at 5 on NBC News Now. For breaking news in our changing world, download the NBC News app. News is happening now. A look at what's making headlines around the world. We're coming on the air with breaking news. This is a significant moment. Whenever it happens, wherever you are, NBC News, streaming free now. For breaking news in our changing world, download the NBC News app. The day's biggest political stories with trusted insight now and expert analysis now. A daily look at the politics behind the headlines. Meet the Press Now, streaming weekdays at 4 p.m. on NBC News Now. Top Story with Tom Yamas, weeknights at 7 on NBC News Now. We'll meet Ukrainians who are defending their country one block at a time. When you were still in Kiev, could you hear the bombing? My name is Lester. Hey, who's this? In the United States, women own less than 20% of all businesses. At the iconic Russ and Daughters, co-owner Nikki Russ Betterman is building on the legacy of her grandmother and great aunts. Growing up, you, you follow in the footsteps of, of strong women who may not have chosen this, but took it on and obviously made it really successful. What is it like for you following in those footsteps? It's a tremendous feeling to be now the and great-granddaughter. Justice Ruth Bader Ginsburg was a good customer of ours. Her family came from the Lower East Side, and she once said that before she knew the word feminist, when she looked up at the sign, Russ and Daughter, she understood that women could have an impact. Your family's business, Russ and Daughter, has survived two world wars, a depression, you're here in the, the shadow of the World Trade Center. Yes. Why has this place been able to not just survive, but thrive? I think because in each generation there has been someone who wanted to do this. This is food that people turn to for comfort in hard times. And during the pandemic, we saw that you know people were shipping Russ and Daughters all over the country to their loved ones because they couldn't be together. And so sending, you know, bagels and locks and babka, say, you know, I love you, I miss you. Here, let me feed you. Having a schmear over Zoom. Oh, there was a lot of that. <laughs> okay, so you can get smoked fish pretty much everywhere these days, but not quite like this. The salmon sold at Russ and Daughters is prized for its high fat content. From the milder Gaspe Nova to the smokier Scottish. And this gourmet fish is all sliced by hand. When you hold it up, I mean, it's it's almost translucent. That. Yeah, I think we should show you how we get at that then. Yeah, me and a sharp utensil, what could possibly go wrong? <laughs> it takes up to six months of training to master the slicing technique here. So Al, I hear you have some knife skills. Well, I've been in a fight or two, but uh, <laughs> it's uh, probably nothing like yours. So how, how long have you been slicing salmon? I've been at the store for 20 years. Wow. Um, so I've been slicing for a while. All right. So, so uh, I watch people slice, and I, uh, I'm amazed at, at how patient, because it seems like that's part of the, the skill. The reality is, when you know how to slice, mm -hmm. it is one of the most relaxing things you can do. Very zen. Very zen. Ooh. Meditative, right? Mm. The trick is don't look anywhere on the fish. You have to really feel the fish. Be the fish. Be the fish, which is a very difficult concept to train yeah, someone. Good. Um, and particularly the first couple slices are, mm. don't be upset okay. if they don't look great. The idea is to make a consistently thick slice. You making so, faces at me? No, I'm just watching you not watch the fish. <laughs> All right. Okay. Here we go. Be the fish. Not looking. You should, you should look. I should you look. You got a sharp knife in your hand, Al. And you can see that as you change the angle of the knife, it changes the thickness. Yeah. Right? So now that's Drastically, a very... Drastically, more than a, you think. That's more than... Oh, my gosh. That's a very thick... We call those chuletas. Chuletas? Yeah. 
chops. Ah. In Spanish. I was going to say, that sounded, that, that didn't sound <laughs> Yiddish. Not, not that Yiddish. did not sound not Yiddish, Yiddish to me. Yeah. Does the way you cut it affect the taste of it or the texture of it? The texture, which uh, affects the experience of the salmon. It's almost like you're eating the essence of salmon, not salmon. It's very delicate. It's a very appealing mm -hmm. texture and, and mouthfeel. Mm -hmm. Yeah, the thinner. Josh, thanks so much. Nice meeting you. Such a pleasure to have you. Ah, smoke them if you got them. Up next, how fresh salmon gets turned into locks. News is happening now. A look at what's making headlines around the world. We're coming on the air with breaking news. This is a significant moment. Whenever it happens, wherever you are, NBC News, streaming free now. Today is now a podcast, available every morning. Listen wherever you get your podcasts. News is happening now. Look at what's making headlines around the world. Right now on Morning News Now. We're coming on the air with breaking news. And this is a significant moment. Whenever it happens, wherever you are, NBC News, streaming free now. Hallie Jackson Now. Weekdays at 5 on NBC News Now. For breaking news in our changing world, download the NBC News app. Hallie Jackson Now. Weekdays at 5 on NBC News Now. These days, it feels like the news never stops. So let's get into it. What's happening right now, what it all means for you for an hour every day. It can be hard to keep up, so let's get started together. Hallie Jackson Now, weekdays at 5 on NBC News Now. Good evening from New Orleans. Nice to go really spend some time with you. Appreciate it. For breaking news in our changing world, download the NBC News app. I'm here at the Acme Smoked Fish Factory. Now there is something fishy going on in there and you better believe I'm gonna find out what it is. The folks at Acme process, smoke, and pack nearly eight million pounds of fish every year. They sell to eateries all over the country, including Russ and Daughters. It smells of smoke and it smells of fish. That's the way it's supposed to be. It smells right. like New York City. Yes. All right, so as you know, in any food food plant, food safety is uh -huh. of paramount importance. Right. I see you got your boots on I here. just happen to be wearing these. Awesome. <laughs> I'll walk you through the process of how salmon turns into smoked salmon. Adam Caslow is the fourth generation owner of Acme Smoked Fish. His great grandfather, Harry Brownstein, started selling fish after immigrating from Russia to Brooklyn. Wow. Harry started in the smoked fish business in the early 1900s, in 1906 to be exact. Out, he of, went, out of a push cart? Out of a, 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 a horse drawn wagon. Wow. He would go around buying fish from different smokehouses throughout Brooklyn and Queens and had himself the sales route. You know, he worked close to 45 years. I mean, his dream was to open up his own smokehouse, and it took him 45 years to finally achieve that. Wow. Adam now runs a massive smoked fish empire, supplying many of New York City's popular bagel shops, from H&H &H to Essa Bagel. Acme also selling to national grocers like Trader Joe's. At the end of the day, it's all about the fish. We bring in fish from all over the world. Uh -huh. Smoked salmon is probably the most popular thing that we make, and our salmon come from 
different places, Norway, Scotland, Chile, and Alaska. It can take up to five days to make smoked salmon. Every order is made to the buyer's tastes, from the type of salmon to the curing method. The first step, cutting a whole fish into fillets. Whoa! Yeah, so this is a 12 kilo whole salmon Jeez. that I caught over here in Long Island Sound. No, I'm just kidding. <laughs> this is an Atlantic salmon. Uh -huh. It's farm, farm raised. We use Atlantic salmon because it has the, the most fat and fat equals flavor when making smoked, smoked salmon. Right. So what are you cutting out the, like the backbone there? Yeah, just do the bone. Uh-huh. Carving into a fish this size requires expert hands. After the fish is filleted, it's preserved with salt. The fish is then treated with a wet brine or a dry cure. Okay, so let's dry, dry cure some, some salmon. Yeah. First thing, we're gonna get it onto the uh, raft. Okay. okay. So, see if you can pick up this salmon, grab it by the, by the, the tail. Okay. Grab with your other hand. Underneath. And we're gonna lay it onto this, the, the screen. Okay. Step two, we're gonna grab a handful of salt. So it's just a thin layer. Yep. Right along the top of the dorsal. Like kind of down the center line, I suppose. And we'll give it a nice love, love tap. That's it? That's it. This fish is rather large. So traditionally, we would probably dry, uh, wet brine uh -huh. this, this fish, but for smaller fish, the, the dry cure lasts about 24 hours. Okay, that's a huge fish. Right. After curing, the fillets are cold smoked for up to 20 hours. This process imparts a subtle smoky flavor. Let me show you how the smoker works. So these are a collection of that wood chip blend that we were uh, talking about earlier. There are different ways to smoke fish fillets. Hot smoking results in flaky, opaque fillets. Unlike traditional lox, smoked salmon is cold smoked below 85 degrees. This helps the fish retain its silky texture and makes it perfect for slicing. Ready to help me get this bad boy into the You oven? bet. All right. All right. Hey now. Let's close her up. Woo! Shut her down. After the smoker, the fish is cooled, then packed for shipping. What would your great grandfather say if he could see all of this? I think he'd be amazed at how difficult it was for him to achieve his dream. Right. Now his descendants have been able to build upon that dream and build us into one of the preeminent smokers in the U.S. Up next, a vegan deli taking on tradition with plant-based lox and cashew cream cheese? Oh, you don't want to miss this. Live from Ukraine, from Uvalde, Texas, from Mayfield, Kentucky. To cover the news, you have to be in it. This is how so many towns and cities are protecting themselves. You can actually see they're pushing the gates open. Was there a school officer on campus? That's what we've been told. No. Do you remember any tornado as bad as this one? You look at this and you're thinking, we're not going to have power for weeks, if not months. Exactly. Every night, it's your news playlist. Top Story with Tom Yamas. Weeknights at 7 on NBC News Now. To cover the news, you have to be in it. This is how so many towns and cities are protecting themselves. They're pushing the gates open. Was there a school officer on campus? That's what we've been told. No, top story with Tom Yamas. Weeknights at 7 on NBC News Now. Live from Ukraine, from Uvalde, Texas, from Mayfield, Kentucky. To cover the news, you have to be in it. This is how so many towns and cities are protecting themselves. You can actually see they're pushing the gates open. Was there a school officer on campus? That's what we've been told. No. Do you remember any tornado as bad as this one? You look at this and you're thinking, we're not going to have power for weeks, if not months. Exactly. Every night, it's your news playlist. Top Story with Tom Yamas. Weeknights at 7 on NBC News Now. Today is now a podcast. Available every morning. Listen wherever you get your podcasts. Now Tonight with Joshua Johnson, streaming weeknights at 8 on NBC News Now. Back on the Lower 
East Side, two sisters, inspired by their Jewish heritage, are on a mission to make the food they loved growing up in a more sustainable way. Ladies, nice to meet you. Nice to meet Boom. you. Boom, want to show me around? Please, come Play, on in. Lead away. Erica and Sarah Kaberski are the co-owners of Orchard Grocer, an entirely vegan market inspired by classic delicatessens. This is our healthy cashew cheese cheese. They want to make the vegan lifestyle easier for all. Right after college, they opened their first business, a shoe store called Moo Shoes. We opened our vegan shoe store 20 years ago. How are they? They're comfortable? They are. About five years ago, we decided that we were going to update it by adding our vegan grocer, basically because it seemed like that's what our customers want. Um, after asking us what our shoes were made of, probably where should I go eat was um, the second most common question. So we decided to create an experience where they could just go eat next door. Growing up in Queens, the sisters' Jewish culture and food were closely linked. They had 10 Jewish delis in their neighborhood alone. Probably every Sunday, a tradition in our family, a dozen bagels um, at the bagel store. A dozen always meant 15. I don't know <laughs> why that was, but and uh, with the cream cheese and lox, and that was just uh, how we spent our Sundays. Both sisters became vegan as teenagers, but felt they lost a piece of their roots by giving up certain foods. I think our parents were supportive of our changes to the vegan lifestyle. We grew up in a very culturally Jewish household, so all of our traditions were just based around food. Today, a lot of folks are going vegan for a variety of reasons, from reported health benefits to concerns over animal welfare. For the sisters, it's also a matter of global importance. Now we're watching climate change happen right now, and. I think that's causing a lot of people to think twice about what they're eating and how they are contributing. So it makes sense to us that it is becoming so mainstream. In 2017, Sarah and Erica saw not just an opportunity to satisfy a growing market, but to pay homage to their Jewish roots. We wanted to have a, a good sandwich selection that really epitomizes like New York deli food. So obviously a bagel and mox was gonna be there. Orchard Grocer sells a variety of vegan sandwiches, including Reuben's and tuna melts. But the sisters are most passionate about serving up a sense of nostalgia. People are so worried about giving things up. So I think just creating those alternatives and just something that people are familiar with and gives them that feeling of home. Yeah, like we haven't had to give up our Sunday tradition of um, bagels and lox. To help make their unique deli a reality, the sisters hired vegan chef Nora Vargas. Nora shares a passion for plant-based foods. She also knows how to turn carrots into salty locks. How did you come up? I mean, you have to think, okay, what can mimic uh, mm -hmm. a smoked salmon? Yeah. Uh, and so how did you, was it look like, like you yeah. thought, well, the only orange vegetable out there, <laughs> exactly. other than a sweet potato, <laughs> is carrot. We know the texture that we need to go for. We know the flavor that we want to go for so we started with the color and then we just kind of built it from there okay so let's get started I'm, I'm really fascinated okay all right I'm excited so we have prepared what do we have maybe 10 pounds of carrots here wow. for you these are huge these would have been huge carrots seriously yeah like wow. the size of my forearm but you <laughs> you have you have Slice them very thin on a mandolin? Yes, yeah, okay. exactly. All right, so we're all gloved up and we are going to, the next step in this process is to uh, apply our rub okay. to our carrots. So in here we have a mixture of sugar, salt, and the rest I can't tell you about. Oh, uh, it's a secret exactly. kind of thing. So yeah. this, this would be kind of like the brine that you would mm -hmm. use, the dry brine that you would use yes. on fish. Exactly. Except yeah. it's going on vegetables. Yeah. We got our inspiration for a lot of different components of this recipe from the way that you would actually prepare fish if we were preparing fish and not carrots. Right. Coat everything. Hmm. Interesting. Oh no, don't smell it. Don't, don't figure out the secret just I'm, by smelling I'm, it. Okay, now. Because if I figure it out, she's going to have to kill me. <laughs> So I'm just going to start rubbing, just smushing everything in there. Once we get everything coated, we would let this sit for three to six hours, mm -hmm. probably. Okay, great. So I think we've, I think we nailed it. Okay. In here. Another secret ingredient? Definitely. Jeez, yeah, a, but I can tell A lot you. of secrets here at Orchard. <laughs> 
I'll tell you a little bit. Okay. Okay. So it's a combination of olive oil mm -hmm. and aquafaba. Aquafaba. Yeah. Are you familiar with that ingredient? I don't know. You know when you're opening up a can of beans right. and you got to drain them. Yes. The stuff that you drain out, that's aquafaba. Aquafaba. It's like, it's bean water. It's bean bean juice. Yes, exactly. Okay. Yeah. Okay, so I'm gonna pour, okay. and then you can kind of do the same process. Okay, that we same did before. process. Just squish it all in there, okay? Yeah, perfect. After we had let our carrots sit for three to six hours, right. um, we tossed them in the oven. So they bake. We like to call it cold smoking just ah. to sound like classy. Like the process of making smoked salmon. Exactly, yeah. That okay. does look very much like smoked salmon. <laughs> and what would a bagel and lox be without the cream cheese? This vegan spread is made with raw cashews, salt, some secret spices, and coconut oil, all blended together with soft tofu. Should we make a bagel? Sure, let's do it. Cheers. This is a really terrific idea. Thank I'm, you. Thank you for opening my eyes. Oh, thank you so much. I appreciate it. That yeah. was fantastic. Like it was a great way to finish things up. I mean, we've, we've seen the history, we've gone to the past, we were in the present, and you have brought us the locks and bagels of the future! <laughs> A bagel with cream cheese and smoked salmon is a uniquely American combination. Born from Jewish roots, transformed by local ingredients, and carried on by new generations, this breakfast tradition has truly stood the test of time when it comes to food in New York City. Shop All Day contributor Chassis Post, and I know trends. Each week I'm here with the must-have fashion and beauty products at a price you'll like in Style Finder. I'm fashion and beauty expert Makon Jovu, and I'm bringing you industry insiders and those in the know to share all the buzzworthy products sweeping social media in influencer trends. And I'm Shop All Day contributor Jen Falk, and I love finding the best versions of everyday items in Better Basics. This is Shop All Day, Fall Feels. Hi, I'm Shop All Day contributor Chassie Post, and we're back today with another episode of Shop All Day. And this week, we are all about the fall feels. From shackets, that's a shirt jacket, to scarves creating the ultimate cozy setting at home, and candle scents like sweater weather and fireside chats. And what if I told you, you don't need matches anymore to light them? We've got the must-have lighter for all your cozy nights, plus a conversation with the Hills alum turned entrepreneur, Lauren Conrad, about her favorite picks this time of year and her fall collection. So let's get to it. I am so excited about this first item because it proves that you don't have to sacrifice style to be comfy. Because even though we're starting to get dressed again, I am so not ready to let go of my sweats. And the great news is, we don't have to. Designers are listening and check out what we have here today. We have an elevated take on the sweatsuit, which I like to call the sweat set. So here's what's so great about it. On the face of it, we have two separates, two elevated takes on sweatsuit separates, right? That we can mix in with the rest of our wardrobe. But get ready for the magic. Check it out. When we pair these two little pieces together, ah, we get a jumpsuit. So it feels like you're wearing a sweatsuit because technically you are, but it doesn't look like you're wearing a sweatsuit. And I love these little beautiful elevated details. Like on the sweatshirt, you've got the ruffled sleeve, which is such a big trend. And it's a great slouchy silhouette. And check out, of course, we've got the easy drawstring waist, the elastic waistband for the jogger pant. But guess what? It's a little bit more tapered. So this is a sweat set that we can take on the world <laughs> feeling like we're on trend and in style. 
So now get ready to wrap yourself in a blanket of chicness. I've been waiting for fall to arrive just so I can rock the oversized blanket trend. And I mean, nothing says fall, like a lush, rich, tartan plaid scarf. And I've gotta say, this scarf feels so luxurious. It's cashmere-like material, and it's really generous. It's really big. And my jaw dropped when I saw the price of this. I couldn't believe it because it just feels so luxurious and soft and cozy. So of course, with the blanket scarf, it's like a blanket, right? So there are a million ways to wear it. I love it. You can wear it just as a scarf, put it around a couple of times. It's really great with a little jacket or a blazer but I also love to wear it as a shawl, or you can wear it as a wrap. You can even wear it as a cape. We're seeing lots of capes this season. So it is remarkable how a little blanket scarf, you know, oversized, yes, that is the trend, can transform anything you pair it with. And I mean, Tartan, come on, that's fall feels for you. So I love this episode because everything is just so useful and we've got another fall fashion must have that does double duty and does it quite stylishly, might I say. So here we've got Madewell's Chelsea rain boot. And guess what? You don't have to just wear them in the rain. So they're rugged enough that they can take on any kind of downpour. I mean, Madewell says that they actually storm tested these, but guess what? You don't just have to wear them in the rain. They're good looking enough to wear every single day. And I've got to say, they're made with a really high quality rubber that somehow doesn't even look like rubber. They also have this very easy pull on Chelsea boot style, but they've also got the lug sole. And guys, the lug sole, and what that really means is, it's a fancy word for chunky sole, is one of the biggest trends in boots we're seeing for fall. And I mean, this is really gonna take on some puddles for you. So it's up to you. You can either wear these as one of the best looking rain boots you've ever worn, or one of the best looking regular boots you've ever worn. It's up to you. So now we've got one of my favorite fashion hacks for fall, the blazer. And a great blazer really is an instant outfit maker. You can pair it with absolutely anything in your closet and you look pulled together. This blazer, it does everything the average blazer will do, but guess what? It's another multitasker two in one. It's called the oversized blazer jacket. And not only can you wear it as a blazer, but you can also wear it as a jacket. And that's due to this terrific cut. So it's slightly oversized. It's really comfortable to wear. It's that boyfriend trend that we've been seeing everywhere. And it's also a little longer. So that helps to give it the versatility. So you can wear it as either a blazer or you can wear it as a jacket. And so another big trend that we're seeing as we talked about the tartan, our plaids. Designers are mad for plaid this fall. So plaid just screams fall, right? It's really what I want to wear. And this jacket is a great medium weight, so it really does lend itself as a coat. When you get to work, you don't even have to take it off. Once you get to work, this clocks in as a blazer, right? So the jacket blazer. I think it's so clever. So ready for another multitasker. How about a shacket? Is it a shirt? Is it a jacket? It's both. You better get used to this word because the shacket trend is huge this season. And what makes this shacket so special is the luxurious materials. I mean, here we've got flannel. And again, that's another great fall material. It's so soft. We've got more plaids and we've also got corduroy. I mean, corduroy is having a huge comeback. Remember corduroy? You put on your corduroy pants and you knew it was fall. And so with the shacket, of course, it's a great sort of more oversized cut, which means you can wear it inside as a shirt or outside as a jacket. It's a great layering piece. And what I also like about this particular shacket is it's got some more sort of high-end details. I mean, I really like the breast pockets and all the snap details. It's also really affordable. This jacket, it's a good jacket. 
<laughs> and last but not least, in case you weren't sure how much we love comfort, we thought we'd give you one more elevated take on your favorite loungewear that can take you from the sofa to the office. So this is Everlane's lightweight French Terry Crew. And what's so great about this is, I mean, it's another elevated take on our loungewear. And I really kind of think about this piece as the new sweater, right? Because you can wear it anywhere you might wear a sweater. It's got lots of great elevated details. So it's got the wider crew neck top. Check out the raglan sleeve. That's, you know, code for the bat wing sleeve. And exaggerated sleeves are another big trend that we're seeing this fall. It also has a really nice band at the bottom. So it means it's easy to tuck in or you can wear it out and this material. Okay, so it's nice enough to be business in front, but on the inside, it's that soft French terry and it's really feels really good next to your skin and no one has to know just how comfortable you are. <laughs> so I think this is a great piece that you can wear, of course, on your couch with your joggers and your jeans, or you can dress it up with a really nice trouser, a great midi skirt and wear it to work. Let's go through these products one more time. We've got the two-piece jogger set, the plaid scarf, the Chelsea rain boot, the oversized blazer jacket, the shacket, and the French Terry Crew sweatshirt. And just so you know, today works with affiliate partners and earns a commission on purchases made through our links at today.com. And that's it for Style Finder. Up next, Mako Inlogu is talking to fashion designer and New York Times bestselling author, Lauren Conrad, about her fall favorites, including her go-to sneaker. Then later, Jen Fallick is bringing you better basics. We're talking a smart mug that keeps your drink at your desired temperature and a candle that is literally called Fall Feels. So don't go away. NBC News, streaming free now. To cover the news, you have to be in it. This is how so many towns and cities are protecting themselves. They're pushing the gates open. Was there a school officer on campus? That's what we've been told. No, top story with Tom Hamas. Weeknights at 7 on NBC News Now. For breaking news in our changing world, download the NBC News app. News is happening now. Look at what's making headlines around the world. Right now on Morning News Now. We're coming on the air with breaking news. And this is a significant moment. Whenever it happens, wherever you are, NBC News, streaming free now. Today is now a podcast, available every morning. Listen wherever you get your podcasts. Top Story with Tom Yamas, weeknights at 7 on NBC News Now. Now tonight with Joshua Johnson, streaming weeknights at 8 on NBC News Now. NBC News, streaming free now. NBC News, streaming free now. News is happening now. To look at what's making headlines around the world. We're coming on the air with breaking news. This is a significant moment. Whenever it happens, wherever you are, NBC News, streaming free now. Hallie Jackson now, weekdays at 5 on NBC News Now. For breaking news in our changing world, download the NBC News app. These days, it feels like the news never stops. So let's get into it. What's happening right now, what it all means for you for an hour every day. It can be hard to keep up, so let's get started together. Hallie Jackson Now, weekdays at 5 on NBC News Now. Today is now a podcast, available every morning. Listen wherever you get your podcasts. Welcome back. I'm Makon Jovu and this is Influencer Trends, where I'll be talking to industry insiders and they'll share their favorite products and the must-have items to shop for right now. 
And don't forget the QR code at the bottom of your screen. Use the camera on your smartphone and scan it to shop these products. Now, for many of us, fall is all about picking apples, changing over your wardrobe to some warmer options, and just being downright cozy. And we've got a special guest here to help us fall back. She's a designer with multiple lines at Kohl's, a New York Times bestselling author, and a philanthropist who co-founded The Little Market. Lauren Conrad is here. Hi, Lauren. How are you today? I'm good. How are you? I'm doing great. So excited to be chatting with you. You too. We first met you as a teen on the hills, and now you're a designer, an entrepreneur, an author, a wife, a mother of two, and the list goes on and on. Who is Lauren Conrad now? I'm a working mom right now. I um, stay pretty busy, but I'm having so much fun having a family. Um, and I still really love my jobs. So. Oh, that's so awesome. We love that about you. Now, from the first time we met you, I guess, you know, we all fell in love with you. We still love you now. How have you grown from the first time that the audience has met you? Oh man, well, I think I was, I think I just turned 18. So I'm quite a bit older now. <laughs> and yeah, I had like a very unique experience of kind of figuring out who I was while sharing my life. So I've grown up a lot. I'm definitely more confident and independent. You know, it took years to prove myself, both in my career and just in my life. Well, I'll tell you what, you still look the same. So you may be different in all the ways that you've grown, but I'm like, oh my gosh, she still looks the same. Right. So now because you are a mom, I do have to ask you, your kids are so adorable. We're heading into fall. Do you guys have any like cozy family fall traditions that you do at home? We bake a lot. I, we're getting more into that. My older son, who's four now, can now like really help out in the kitchen. So that's been something really fun. But they're still really small. So we're kind of like creating our own traditions right now, which is really fun. I mean, we do like the basic ones. Like I can't wait to get to a pumpkin patch with them and do all of that. But yeah, we're at that point in life where we're making our traditions. Yeah, that's so cool. And they're so fun yeah. at this age. So you can really have a lot of fun with them. All right, let's talk about your collection with Kohl's. The collection was started over 10 years ago and it's grown so much since we started with just apparel and now we do apparel, we do accessories, we have home items. We now have expanded this last year into kids, which was amazing. It's been really fun to watch it grow and what started out to be a clothing line become more of a lifestyle brand. I'm curious to know what inspired this beautiful collection. Oh, thank you. So um, every time we look at fall, because we are kind of a California brand and, you know, weather's different everywhere, we really want fall pieces to feel like wear now, and then you can kind of layer them later. You know, I like getting pieces that I know are gonna last for a while. So like, for example, the dress that's next to you can be worn, you know, with an open-toed shoe, maybe a light layer, but like you could wear that right now. But it's also something that you could layer a tight in later and, you know, a closed-toed shoe or a booty. I, I think that people want the most out of their clothes, especially right now. So that's always like our first approach. Yeah. Um, and then just kind of different ideas of how to style them. Perfect, I love everything about that. And we love it so much. I wanna start with the sweater. I gotta tell you, I'm like all about elevating my basics. So let's start with the sweater. Sure, so the sweater, which I actually, here, I have one here too. So, you know, after this past year, I feel like everybody is very invested in comfort. Mm -hmm. I know I am. I do need to start looking more put together. You know, people are getting back to the office, getting back to life, but sweatpants were so nice. So I we did a lot of pieces in like these really cozy, yummy yarns. Elevated details like ruffles, still feeling feminine, and still put, and put together, but again, not sacrificing comfort, which I really love. So this is also one of my favorite pieces. And I love these like really denim friendly blues. They're just so easy to wear. Mm -hmm. And then the dress is it's like a smocked waist dress. So it's really comfortable, easy to fit lots of different body types. And it has a little hit of foil on it. So it just gives it a little bit of shine, makes it feel a bit more dressed up. I really love this one. It's like, it feels dressed up, but it's still like a little boho and you could wear it during the day with a flat. So it's just, True. again, like an easy to wear kind of transitional item. I like what you said about transitional item because I'm thinking about wearing this with like booties, a pair of boots, mm -hmm. like this is so cute. Let's talk about the home items now. I want to talk about this cozy blanket and this star pillow. Now this is from your kids line. Do I understand that correctly? 
Yes. So Little Co, we launched this past year a kids line. We've actually just expanded sizes to, to eight, so newborn to size eight. And it's um, it's all sustainable fabric. So like most of the pieces are made using organic cottons and it's just really easy basics. Um, a lot of gender neutral pieces, like great to pass on between siblings or match. So we launched that. And then since we've had so much success with it, we know that uh, a lot of times people like will fall in love with the brand and want to have it used all around the home as well. So we did some um, home pieces. So we did like you have a pillow there, a throw, we did crib sheets and like a lot of different bedding and stuff. So I I like to kind of switch the boys' rooms up uh -huh. season to season with little items. So like the two you have there are really easy to kind of trade in. So it's whether it's bringing in like those warm yellows or, you know, just, just little touches kind of makes the room feel updated without having to redo it. I love that. And I've got to tell you, Lauren, I feel like all my friends are either new moms or they're expecting yeah. babies and I never know what to buy. So I like that you have these items because I can just pick mm. these up and they're unisex. Okay, let's talk about your personal fall favorites. I want to start with the Converse. Is this your everyday sort of uniform? Is this what you're wearing every day? It is. So, I mean, you know, the sneakers are huge right now. And I kind of, I try to do the like chunkier, like almost like seventies dad sneaker. And it just looks silly on me. So I went more traditional. This is actually <laughs> my, my son wears high tops every day because he plays hard and the high tops keep the sand out of his shoes. So he started wearing high tops and then asking to match me. So I was looking through and I really loved these. They're like a, um, a crew or like a parchment. They're like an off white. Mm -hmm. So it's like a classic, but it's a more fall neutral, which I really liked. So I actually had just bought these myself when you guys asked me my favorite. So I was like, perfect. <laughs> um, just an easy sneak. It is. I feel like you can wear this pretty much everywhere. Now we've got you covered yeah. with the feet and I'm looking at this Madewell necklace and it's absolutely stunning. Are we mixing metallics? Are we wearing it as is? Talk to me about this one. Yeah, so chains are everywhere, mixed metals. I think it's it's one of those things where you kind of make it your own. Some people are gonna wear it, you know, just a simple chain. Other people are gonna layer in different kinds of chains, different metals, you know, whatever, and make it like more of a heavy feel. Yeah. I don't know, it's one that's really easy to personalize, but I've been buying more just like simple chains to kind of mix in with pendants. Mm -hmm. I love the look of it. And it just, it does, you know, sometimes with paper clip necklaces, you're like, is it flimsy? And it looks great, the mm -hmm. color looks amazing. Well, Lauren, this has been so much fun chatting with you today. Thank you so much for joining us. Yeah, thanks for having me. All right, so let's run through all of the products one more time. First up, the ruffle cardigan, the long sleeve mini peasant dress, the star pillow, the blanket, the Chuck 70 sneakers from Converse, and the Madewell chain. And just so you know, Today works with affiliate partners and earns a commission on purchases made through our links at today.com. Up next, Jen Fallick is bringing you Better Basics. Now guys, we're talking about a smart mug that keeps your drink at your desired temperature. Plus, you can take it with you and a rechargeable lighter so you won't have to light matches anymore. I'm excited about that. Stay tuned. News is happening now. A look at what's making headlines around the world. We're coming on the air with breaking news. This is a significant moment. Whenever it happens, wherever you are, NBC News, streaming free now. Today is now a podcast, available every morning. Listen wherever you get your podcasts. For breaking news in our changing world, download the NBC News app. NBC News, streaming free now. Now tonight with Joshua Johnson, streaming weeknights at 8 on NBC News Now. The day's biggest political stories with trusted insight now and expert analysis now. A daily look at the politics behind the headlines. Meet the Press Now, streaming weekdays at 4 p.m. on NBC News Now. For breaking news in our changing world, download the NBC News app. News is happening now. A look at what's making headlines around the world. We're coming on the air with breaking news. This is a significant moment. Whenever it happens, wherever you are, NBC News, streaming free now. Today is now a podcast, available every morning. Listen wherever you get your podcasts. NBC News, streaming free now. News is happening now. Are you ready? 
look at what's making headlines around the world. Right now on Morning News Now. We're coming on the air with breaking news. And this is a significant moment. Whenever it happens, wherever you are, NBC News, streaming free now. Top Story with Tom Yamas, weeknights at 7 on NBC News Now. The day's biggest political stories with trusted insight now and expert analysis now. A daily look at the politics behind the headlines. Meet the Press Now, streaming weekdays at 4 p.m. on NBC News Now. NBC News, streaming free now. Today is now a podcast, available every morning. Listen wherever you get your podcasts. Allie Jackson Now, weekdays at 5 on NBC News Now. Hey everyone, welcome back. I'm Shop All Day contributor Jen Fallick, and this is a fun show today because it is all about the fall feels. And I can't wait to show you how to create the ultimate cozy setting at home, from candles to the right tools to keep your drinks warm. And see the QR code at the bottom of your screen? You can use the camera on your smartphone to scan it for instant access to the products on the show today. So let's get to it. Let's start with the first thing I always do when I'm prepping my home for fall, and that is fill in with throw blankets. I love a great cozy throw to stay warm on a chilly fall night, and these new throws are from Brooklinen. So Brooklinen is so beloved for their super soft and cozy bedding, sheets, comforters. Now they have finally come out with throw blankets. This is something people have been wanting for a long time. It's sure to be on everyone's hot list this fall. There's all these different color combinations to choose from. I love this to add a punch of color. If you have a neutral living room, throwing something like this in there is gonna make it really feel on trend for fall. And I love these as well with a little bit of fringe. The perfect thing to cozy up with. And once you're all snuggled in with your blanket, the next thing obviously you need to do is set the mood with an amazing fall fragrance candle. So this brand really aims to bring comfort through candles that captures memories with your favorite people, including all those fall activities that we know and love. Not only are they beautiful to look at, they come in all the fall colors that we love and crave, but they smell incredible. I love this one. This is all about the fall fields and family gatherings. There's so many nice scents to choose from and they just look as good as they smell. Then when you wanna light those cozy fall candles to set the mood, I have the must have solution that has honestly changed my life. I have these all over my house. So this is an electric lighter. You charge it up, it's a USB charger. It's gonna last you so long with one charge. Easy to use and windproof. So if you're lighting candles, the windows are open, you're outside in the fall weather, this is gonna be huge because if you're using a traditional lighter or a match, you tend to always go out before you get the candle lit. With this, so easy. All you do, flip it on, give it a little light, and a light candles. There we go. Another really wonderful thing about these electric lighters are the safety features. So this one in particular, if the light is turned on for too long, it's gonna turn the flame off. I love that because I've got young kids in my house. There's also a safety lock. So for me, this feels much better to have around out and about the house than a book of matches. It could potentially be a little dangerous. I love these. I mean, there's fun colors too. I find this to be a great thing to buy in bulk because I love giving it to people as gifts. If there's someone that you need to give a gift to and you feel like they have everything in the world, if you're going over to their house one day for a cozy fall dinner, this is something that tends to always impress. Now, next up, if candles aren't your thing, this diffuser is going to be right up your alley. I love this. This is from Nest Fragrances. This is brand new. This diffuser gives you 30 days of uninterrupted Nest Fragrances in your home. The design also is gorgeous. I mean, it's really modern and sleek. It literally blends right into the wall and you get the most delicious scent. So these are some of my favorite scents. I love the bamboo to be really fresh in the kitchen area. Also, the Rose Noir is one of my favorites to kind of set a more like kind of cozy mood upstairs. And the grapefruit is so refreshing. I put that in my girls' rooms. It's just a cheerful scent for every day. And what's so special about these is that you know it's exactly 30 days of scent. So it's easy to remember every 30 days, the beginning of a new month, you want to change it out. And there are some scents that are so perfect for fall, you really can change the ambiance of your entire home with these. 
So now let's move into the kitchen. Nothing says fall feels like soup. So we are starting with an insanely popular immersion hand blender. What's great about having an immersion hand blender is that it takes all the things that used to require a giant, bulky, hard to clean blender and makes them easy to do right in the saucepan or the pot that you're making the soup. I love that these are easy to clean, easy to use, and they get the job done. These work wonders. Just because it's smaller than your traditional gigantic blender, that doesn't mean that it's any less powerful at pureeing and chopping up the ingredients that you need for your favorite cozy fall soup or a fall dip. This is a really wonderful kitchen hack, especially if you're low on storage. Fall feels wouldn't be fall feels without cozy apple cider and hot chocolate and cinnamon coffee, maybe pumpkin spice. You want to keep that coffee nice and warm or keep your tea nice and warm. I love these ember mugs because I don't think I've ever actually made it through a cup of coffee without having to reheat it at some point. So the ember mugs Keep your coffee or your tea or your apple cider at the perfect temperature. All you need to do is charge up the base, you put the mug on top, you can set it via an app also to have your exact perfect temperature for different beverages. And these new versions here, so we've got the traditional mug that comes in two sizes, and there's also now a travel mug. And you can also use it with the Ember app so that even if you're not right next to your cup of coffee or tea, you can keep it the exact temperature that you want it simply by setting it on the app for all the different beverages that you know and love. The design is great. I think they work with any sort of decor. Awesome year round, especially now, if you're getting back to work, we're getting back into our fall routines, it's gonna be hectic in the morning, there's no doubt about that. So having something like this helps you keep those cozy fall vibes, even if you're running around and don't get to drink your yummy pumpkin tea on the second that you brew it. And lastly, this is not your grandmother's slow cooker. For all of those warm comfort meals that you know you crave when the fall weather kicks in, this is going to be the ultimate multitasker for you. It's the multi-slow cooker. Use it to make great cozy meals for game day. Use it to make soups. It can cook rice. It's one tool that's going to replace so many bulky things that you otherwise would have to keep in your kitchen. It's a definite fall must-have for those warm, cozy recipes that I know I love making this time of year and it makes it easy for you to do the same. Let's go through these products one more time. And remember, you can use the QR code to get instant access to these items. We've got the throw blankets, the fall scented candles, the electric rechargeable lighter, the Nest home fragrance wall diffuser, the immersion hand blender, the ember mugs, and the multi-slow cooker. And just so you know, Today works with affiliate partners and earns a commission on purchases made through our links at today.com. And that's a wrap on all of your better basics and for our show. It has been so much fun showing you our favorites. And tune in next Thursday for another episode. I'm a compost queen. I have become one with the compost. I'm Sama Dada. I'm a cookbook author and recipe developer in the plant-based food scene, which is becoming more innovative every day. I'm on a mission to see how startups, restaurants, and chefs are changing the way we see and eat plants. And I can't wait to show you how to bring more delicious dishes into your kitchen. Waste. From your rotten produce to your leftover takeout containers, there's a lot of it in the food system these days. A recent study found that the average U.S. household trashes about 30% of its food. That adds up to a mind-blowing $240 billion a year, literally going in the garbage. I know waste seems like a huge problem to tackle when you're just one person, and corporations need to do their part. But a few small changes can make an impact. So today, I'm all about that low-to-no-waste lifestyle. I'll be cooking with an expert in the sustainable food space, social star Max Lamana. Then I'm headed to a restaurant that composts all of its food waste. But first, my fridge needs a little love. So I'm headed to a low waste grocery store and it looks like I've got some packing to do. I'm about to head out to go to Precycle, which is a zero waste grocery store in Brooklyn. The thing about a zero waste grocery store is that there's no packages, so I've got to come prepared. And luckily, I love being prepared. So, I'm gonna start packing up. Pre 
Recycle was started by Katerina Bogatareva in 2018. Her goal? Eliminate wasteful plastic from food packaging. In 2019, over 140 million tons of single-use plastics were thrown out globally. While bulk bins for dried goods have existed at health food stores for many years, Katerina had a different vision. A one-stop shop with everything from flour to produce and even cleaning supplies, all without single-use packaging. Why did you decide to start Recycle? Well, actually, it started with my own personal struggles to, to live a, a lower waste um, lifestyle. Uh, when my son was five years old, he was in a kindergarten and he had a sustainability lesson. So one day he came home and he said, Mommy, do you know how long the plastic will remain in a landfill? And at that moment, it sort of like made me realize that we have a responsibility towards um, next future generations. So I took a very close look at my own trash at home and um, I realized that a lot of the waste that I create actually comes from food shopping, whether it's a packaging or food waste itself. So we can thank your son for this establishment? In a way, yes. You know, it feels like a really big challenge, right, for people to overhaul all of their life choices. It's possible to shop uh, with creating less waste in, in any store. It's just kind of seeing, seeing the right products. For example, I don't know, instead of canned beans, we, one can buy dry beans in a bulk store using a fabric bag or just shopping in a perimeter of the store for um, unpackaged produce or going to farmer's market. And I think a lot of people get really excited when they go to a grocery store and they want to get everything, right? Exactly, yeah. I think shopping for one or two meals or a couple of days in advance is the key because one tends to buy a lot and then with every day that that product sits in your fridge is less likely you're going to use it um, and that creates a lot of waste. Katerina, not to brag or anything, but I came very prepared. So tell me how I get started. Okay, it's very easy. So we're gonna just weigh your, your containers okay. um, so that we know what to deduct when we check you out. All right? All right, let's do it. Let's do it. Here I go. go. And the weight is 0.97. We're gonna write it with this um, washable marker. Oh, that's edgy. There we go. Perfect, and then you're gonna deduct this from whatever I'm putting in here. Exactly. I mean, this is so easy. Forgot containers? Don't worry. The store has a selection of glass jars and reusable bags. So Sama, what are you making today? Honestly, what am I not making today, Katarina? <laughs> but actually, I came here specifically to make a pasta. Oh, wonderful. I have a really nice selection for you. Come go. this way. So this variety is amazing. Where do you source all of these amazing ingredients from? So about 95% of all the products in the store are sourced locally and about 80 hyper locally. So wow. um, this pasta is from New Jersey and this is uh, made uh, in upstate New York. Wow. I also loaded up on my favorite kitchen staples like moong dal, cashews, and of course, a ton of dates. This is the only appropriate size to get some medjool dates, okay? Precycle even has extra virgin olive oil and honey on tap. Even the tofu here comes without wrapping. It feels very overwhelming on where to start. Do you have a couple easy, actionable tips for somebody looking to reduce their waste? Some of the simple ones are reusable water bottle, your own coffee cup if you go to a coffee shop, or just simply bringing a bag. Or if you want to challenge yourself, and maybe that's the next step, you can also look into just what waste you're creating and pick an item that you can replace or, or source differently that works for you. Um, I think it's a very individual journey. It's, it's the, it, there's no recipe that yeah. fits all. Single-use plastics are nearly impossible to avoid at most grocery stores. But shopping at Precycle gave me a new perspective on what's possible. Thank you so much. Thank you. So it's nice to meet you and thank you for having me in. It also had me wondering, how can I waste less in the kitchen? Up next, I've got a virtual cooking lesson with Max Lamana, a vegan chef known for his tasty and sustainable recipes. Top Story with Tom Yamas, weeknights at 7 on NBC News Now. NBC News, streaming free now. 
live from Ukraine, from Uvalde, Texas, from Mayfield, Kentucky. To cover the news, you have to be in it. This is how so many towns and cities are protecting themselves. You can actually see they're pushing the gates open. Was there a school officer on campus? That's what we've been told. No. Do you remember any tornado as bad as this one? You look at this and you're thinking, we're not going to have power for weeks, if not months. Exactly. Every night, it's your news playlist. Top Story with Tom Yamas. Weeknights at 7 on NBC News Now. For breaking news in our changing world, download the NBC News app. To cover the news, you have to be in it. This is how so many towns and cities are protecting themselves. They're pushing the gates open. Was there a school officer on campus? That's what we've been told. No. Top Story with Tom Yamas. Weeknights at 7 on NBC News Now. The day's biggest political stories with trusted insight now and expert analysis now. A daily look at the politics behind the headlines. Meet the Press Now, streaming weekdays at 4 p.m. on NBC News Now. Hallie Jackson Now, weekdays at 5 on NBC News Now. Top Story with Tom Yamas, weeknights at 7 on NBC News Now. Hallie Jackson Now, weekdays at 5 on NBC News Now. Back at my apartment, I couldn't wait to get cooking. To help upgrade my low waste game, I called on London based chef Max Lamana. Max is a vegan social star who focuses on sustainable cooking, and I am here for it. Max, it's so good to see you and chat with you. We are online Instagram friends, but not real life, and this is as close as we're going to get right now since you're in London. Uh, hopefully, when we meet in real life in IRL, we'll, we'll, we could be friends as well. We can be friends and we can cook in person, but for now we're cooking online. Can you talk to me about your background and also what you sort of specialize in when it comes to food? Yeah, I'm a low waste chef. Uh, I started cooking maybe about 15 years ago. Uh, my first job was in a pizza restaurant and I've kind of just worked every single position in a restaurant. So yeah, a few years ago I started seeing the, the, the problem that we, we're all currently living with because at the end of the day, it's not just food that we're wasting, it's money, it's time, it's energy, it's water, it's transportation, it's packaging. There's so much that goes into the production of food that just throwing away food doesn't make any sense. In 2019, Americans threw away over 133 billion pounds of food. The major culprits are typically fresh fruits and fresh vegetables and uh, potatoes and bread. So. A lot is being thrown away, um, but we as consumers can make small changes every day to waste less food. On Instagram, Max teaches his one million followers easy, low-waste food tips. One in particular went pretty viral. Yes, you really can eat an entire strawberry, stems, leaves, and all. Okay, I'm really excited to get cooking with you, so can you tell me what we are making today? Are you ready? We are making cauliflower alfredo. That's it. Simple. Easy. But Delicious. there is a little no waste secret because we're going to use the entire thing, right? The entire thing. Nothing's going to waste, Sama. Everything. Yes. The core, the leaves, even this guy right here, the florets. Everything. First up, prepping our cauliflower. I just have a saucepan of water behind me and that's on a low boil right now. It doesn't get much simpler than this. You don't need to prep or cut or do anything. You just literally take the entire cauliflower, submerge it in the water for about five minutes until it gets fork tender. Um, but I am gonna put some salt in there. You with me, Sama? I'm with you, but I'm just gonna chop it up super roughly before I add it into my steaming basket. You know, you can also save your leaves, and if you were, if you wanted to, you can roast them in in the oven, and they would be nice and crunchy and crispy, a little soft and tender on the inside. Without further ado, Sama, I'm, You're gonna I'm pop ready it to in? give this cauliflower okay. a bath. The cauliflower steams for about five minutes, just until fork tender. Now, on to the garlic. What you can do with garlic peelings. Um, you can actually eat the whole entire garlic peeling as well, um, but we're not gonna, we won't do that here today. You're not gonna demo um, that for me? I'm upset. I won't, I won't, I won't <laughs> demo that for you. I'm not, I'm not gonna eat it. No, I'm not. So, two things you can do. You can dehydrate the skin uh, once it gets nice and dried. Uh, you can blend it into a powdery uh, consistency, and that can be 
uh, basically a powder that can go into any kind of like soups, stews, or stir fries. The other thing I like to do is that I actually keep my peelings. Yeah, I keep my peelings and we'll make a veg stock afterwards. Max sauteed his garlic in olive oil for a subtle sweetness, but I'm leaving mine raw for a spicier kick. So I love this recipe because it, the sauce is super easy. So you're literally just adding all the ingredients into a blender. I'm just gonna cut right down the cauliflower. My cauliflower is finally done. But um ba -dum -bum. Okay, so we're both adding our cauliflower. Uh, florets, stems, leaves, all of the above. I will add my garlic and pasta water. Okay, so I'm gonna add my garlic in, and then I'm also going to add a little bit of my reserve pasta water, just a touch. And this will just help it blend, and also it's a nice way to not waste our pasta water. It gets everything really nicely, nice and velvety. You are using silken tofu for this recipe, right? And I'm gonna right. use hummus. So this is kind of a nice alternative. If you don't do soy, you can try it with hummus. If you do like soy, you can try it with tofu. So we've got options for everyone. And what do you options. think the tofu adds to your Alfredo, Max? Uh, tofu is adding protein, but it's also adding another layer of creaminess as well. Maybe a lighter creaminess than the hummus, but still creamy. Do you have lemon in yours? We have lemon. <laughs> okay, so I'm gonna grab my lemon. Yep. And I want to ask you what you do with lemon peel. The, the peel itself has so much flavor in it. If I'm going to use the juice, I use the zest first and then use the juice. The other thing I like to do as well, if I'm not going to use my lemons in time, I blend the whole entire lemon. Really? With some water and then I pour them into ice cube trays, freeze it, and next day I have frozen lemon cubes and then I can add some, you know, sparkling water. That's really nice, I'm gonna try that. Half the lemon gets zested right into the blender. The rest is saved for later. We've got a lot of our elements in here, but now we're gonna go in with some nutritional yeast, right? A little bit of yes. cheesiness, a savory flavor. All right, what yeast. are you adding next? I'm gonna add some vegan Parmesan. Nice. So this is cool, because yeah. we've got the nutritional yeast for that cheesy flavor. You're using some vegan parm. And then the cauliflower, the tofu, the hummus, they all add these really nice yeah, yeah, like mm, creamy mm, elements, mm, right? Mm. That's, this is, this is my preparation dance for once it's all coming together. It's like, mmm, mmm, mmm. I had some leftover veggie stock, so I poured that in for a little extra flavor. Mmm, mmm, I'm practicing. <laughs> Enough dancing. Time to get blending again. I just hit the switch. <laughs> The two creamy sauces are complete. I'm ready for the pasta. Do you also have some fettuccine? I do. I'm using fettuccine pasta. There you go. Yeah. Okay, so um, I'm going to probably add a little bit of the sauce into the pan to start, just to get it cool. nicely coated with the pasta, and then I'll go ahead and add the pasta in there, and then I'll go ahead and add some of the rest of the sauce. There are some other things you can do with the sauce because there's quite a bit of it, right? Totally. So what you could end up doing with the sauce is use it for soups, use it for stews, use it for even a dip. I mean, I think having a bit of like a, a chip in there that's is really good. Quite, quite nice. Okay, so I'm gonna add my pasta into my little pan and the rest of my sauce. It's so creamy. It's like luscious. Love a saucy pasta, so I love recipes that yield a lot of sauce because I'm like, let's go, you know? A gentle toss in the sauce ensures every piece of pasta is well coated. I'm, more, I'm, I'm ready to plate up, Sama. I'm ready to plate up too, Max. Okay, so I'm gonna save this pasta sauce for tomorrow, but you could also freeze it too, so that's another option. Time to give this pasta a no-waste taste. So we've got our pepper, we've got our lemon zest, we've got our salt. What do you wanna garnish with, the lemon zest? Off on the side, just on top, some lemon zest. Beautiful. I'm happy with the result. How's it looking it on your delicious. end? It's delicious. You know what I think we both have in common is that our phones eat before us. Shall we grab a little our photo? Phones do eat before us. Okay, ready? 
<laughs> I'm ready to eat. You ready to eat? I'm ready, yeah. Okay, let's do it. Okay. Cheers. Cheers. Mm. This is so unexpected and so good. So creamy. Mmm. That's what I was just gonna say. I said this is very, very creamy. So what are some tips that you have, some other tips for people who are looking to reduce their waste in the kitchen and while they're cooking? I think the most practical and easy thing is to cook the food you already have before going out and buying more food. Then shopping and creating a list with that shopping list. And stick to that list, don't go off the list, buying other different bits and bobs, like stick to that list. Um, but before you go there, I think find recipes that work with your schedule. Donating food is a great option, but also my favorite, compost. Composting food shows that food is going back into the earth, back into the soil to give rich nutrients to the soil, giving rich, uh, rich nutrients to the plants that grow our food. Max, this was so much fun. And thank you for doing your work and educating and inspiring people to cook and eat no waste and low waste. It's incredible. That's delicious. This recipe is going to be on repeat for me. Now tonight with Joshua Johnson. Streaming weeknights at 8 on NBC News Now. Live from Ukraine, from Uvalde, Texas, from Mayfield, Kentucky. To cover the news, you have to be in it. This is how so many towns and cities are protecting themselves. You can actually see they're pushing the gates open. Was there a school officer on campus? That's what we've been told. No. Do you remember any tornado as bad as this one? You look at this and you're thinking, we're not going to have power for weeks, if not months. Exactly. Every night, it's your news playlist. Top Story with Tom Yamas. Weeknights at 7 on NBC News Now. NBC News. Streaming free now. News is happening now. Are you ready? Look at what's making headlines around the world. Right now on Morning News Now. We're coming on the air with breaking news. And this is a significant moment. Whenever it happens, wherever you are, NBC News, streaming free now. Allie Jackson now. Weekdays at 5 on NBC News Now. Composting is a crucial part of a low-waste lifestyle. At Papil Gustative in Santa Monica, the owners are committed to composting 100% of leftover food. They operate their own kitchen-to-compost facility where scraps are turned into nutrient-rich mulch. Let me show you around uh, how our low-waste establishment. Let's do it! Papil Gustative translates to taste buds in Latin. It's run by Kalen Senchak and his wife Marina. They use simple but effective methods to cut down on waste. So starting with the to-go, everything is compostable. Starting from the lids, uh, the trays, of course the napkins, and all the cutlery is made out of wood or out of compostable uh, material, paper straws. Even our uh, trash bags, if you see, is a special trash bags that are compostable as well. Even the restaurant's napkins are hand-sewn from recycled jean scraps. And to avoid plastic in the kitchen, chefs use only glass bowls and containers. And what happens, Kaylin, to maybe the fruit or vegetables that aren't perfect when you receive them? We make jams, we make pastries, and for that we actually look for, for fruits and, and vegetables that might be aesthetically blemished, right, but they are perfect. And we, we hate to see the farmers uh, have to throw those away. You have a really huge compost mission with this restaurant. Can you show me how that's kind of done back here as well? Yes, this is our own compost, which is 
coffee, food, greens, eggshells, avocado peels, everything else. Eggshells even? Yes. That's of amazing. course, eggshells, eggs, eggs and coffee are actually uh, one of the best things that you can feed the, the soil for plants, yes? Because of the calcium, because of all the other nutrients, so that's, that makes your garden beautiful. I am so excited and ready to try your food, Kaylin. Should we get into it? Absolutely, let's try everything. Let's do it. Marina and Kaylin are both passionate about building sustainable habits, which led them to the food industry. What was your inspiration behind starting this restaurant? First, we actually were inspired just to open a coffee shop. Uh, coffees and teas, single origin, uh, like really good quality. But then eventually people were asking us about more. They wanted food, they wanted breakfast, they wanted lunch, and we expanded gradually. But Kaylin and Marina are just as focused on what happens after the tables are cleared. You own the composting process from start to finish, even the facility. Can you tell me about that process from start to finish? We have this uh, little property in, in downtown where we have another company and we are thinking why don't we use that, right? So we, we did a little research and then it, it became clear that's very easy to compost if you really put your, your heart into it. So all you have to do is dig some ho holes, aerate them properly and just mix all your, your, your compost there and then eventually you can use it from growing crops. What do you think the restaurant industry can learn from your low waste model? Well, they will learn that's actually very easy to do. You only have to commit, you only have to put a system in place, and it's going to make a great impact at the end of the day. You have kids, and this mission is really important to saving our Earth, right? Absolutely. We're doing it for uh, the future generation, we do it for our kids, we do it for everybody. For their kids and their kids and yes. for all the generations, yeah. The food here speaks for itself. They even have vegan croissants. Yes. This makes me so happy. I like, can never have croissants. It's very important for me to take a photo of everything because otherwise I'll forget and this is the most beautiful thing I've ever seen. After lunch, my leftover scraps went straight into the compost bin. No food waste. Live from Ukraine, from Uvalde, Texas, from Mayfield, Kentucky. To cover the news, you have to be in it. This is how so many towns and cities are protecting themselves. You can actually see they're pushing the gates open. Was there a school officer on campus? That's what we've been told. No. Do you remember any tornado as bad as this one? You look at this and you're thinking, we're not going to have power for weeks, if not months. Exactly. Every night, it's your news playlist. Top Story with Tom Yamas. Weeknights at 7 on NBC News Now. These days, it feels like the news never stops. So let's get into it. What's happening right now, what it all means for you for an hour every day. It can be hard to keep up, so let's get started together. Hallie Jackson Now, weekdays at 5 on NBC News Now. Good evening from New Orleans. Nice to really spend some time with you. Appreciate it. NBC News, streaming free now. For breaking news in our changing world, download the NBC News app. In Santa Monica, California, Papil Gustativ is on a mission to stop food waste. I helped load up the truck that will take their kitchen scraps to the restaurant's very own composting facility. Kevin Conaway is Papil's expert composter. Compost for that, so. Cool. The composting site is located about an hour from the restaurant. Here, they've transformed an empty lot into an urban garden. What are we doing today? What you need to know about composting is that there's not much to know. <laughs> okay. It's pretty much just layering it up. Once we put everything in, what happens in the process? Microorganisms are going to eat the food. They're going to break it down, and pretty much it'll just disappear. It'll all just it'll all just be wet. And we keep it wet, just just a little bit of water. Okay. If it gets too dry, it slows everything down. It's best to compost in a shady area, so Kevin dug up large pits by trees. But you can also compost in any kind of container, from a storage bin to a trash can. All right, Kevin, I'm ready to compost. This is everything we're composting today, right? Yep. First, we made a layer of green materials, which is basically anything left over from the kitchen or garden. 
think veggie scraps, coffee grinds, eggshells, and plant trimmings. Stuff it out, yeah, make a mess. Yeah. And then I can toss the bag in too, right? That's right. Then we added carbon-rich brown materials. This can include shredded paper, cardboard, twigs, and dried leaves. And what do those layers do? What is the cardboard, the sticks? Why are we adding that to the compost process? Because if you have all, or all scraps and no cardboard or no carbon on top of it, it just turns into a mushy, gooey mess. Then, just continue alternating with green and brown layers until the waste is all used up. Okay. Woo! I'm a compost queen. I have become one with the compost. Meat, dairy, and oils should only be broken down by industrial composting facilities. They can attract unwanted pests like rats and flies in a home garden. Meat can also contain harmful bacteria like salmonella, which can spread throughout a garden's edible plants. How long does it take for our compost to break down, Kevin? Generally, anywhere from six months to a year. If you keep it moist, it, it'll be pretty much ready to go in six, nine months. Finished compost is a nutrient-rich mulch. It's a deep brown that basically looks just like dirt. So what have you been growing then with the soil that you kind of can create through the composting just process? Just vegetables, mostly. OK. What yeah, kinds of vegetables? Mostly, yeah. Anything. Peppers, tomatoes, anything that Colleen thinks he needs for his uh, menu, then we'll plant it. This compost garden is still a work in progress, but by next spring, it will produce enough food for regular restaurant use. Kevin, it's really interesting because Vernon is such an industrial area, right? And you're literally creating a compost facility right in its backyard. You don't need a plot of land to compost. You could literally compost in an apartment, be on a smaller scale this kind of material in a landfill, it doesn't really break down and do any good. So instead of throwing them in the landfill and just going to waste, we can recycle those nutrients, put it back into the soil. Kevin, thank you so much for teaching me how to compost. It was shockingly way easier than I expected. And I will be back to reclaim my duties as your apprentice composter. <laughs> thank you. Managing food waste is a massive undertaking and many changes can only be made through legislation. The EPA found that less than 10% of U.S. households had access to curbside compost collection in 2017. That's a lot of food we could be saving from landfills if we just had compost bins next to recycling and trash. Some big changes are already in the works. Major cities like Los Angeles and New York are expanding city-run composting, and those advances are due in large part to individuals petitioning for better policies. Sometimes it takes local changes to kickstart a global impact. Good morning, it's Thursday. Breaking news, legal troubles deepening on several fronts for Donald Trump. Yeah, and he's speaking out about it overnight. It is September 22nd. This is Today. Under pressure, the former president facing a pair of legal setbacks over the past 24 hours. Overnight, the Justice Department regaining access to those classified documents seized at Mar-a-Lago. Trump fighting back in a new interview with this stunning claim. You're the president of the United States. You can declassify just by saying um, it's declassified, even by thinking about it. While in New York, Trump and his company and his children sued by the state's attorney general, accusing them of staggering fraud to help build their empire. So what does it all mean and where does it go from here? We'll break it all down for you. Breaking overnight, protests erupt in Russia. People there now fleeing over Vladimir Putin's efforts to call up hundreds of thousands of new troops. And President Biden delivering a harsh rebuke on the world stage, slamming the Russian leader for escalating the war in Ukraine with nuclear threats. We'll stand in solidarity against Russia's aggression, period. We will have the very latest. Ready, set, hike. The Fed increases interest rates for the third consecutive time. The goal? Easing the pain of Americans still facing soaring inflation and rising prices. Straight ahead, what it all means for your bottom line. 
Bracing for impact, a hurricane warning now issued for Bermuda as Fiona bears down. Plus, all eyes on the next big storm likely headed for the Gulf Coast. Al's tracking both of them. Those stories plus, scary encounter, a jogger's alarming video going viral. And there's this guy in a red car that's driven by me twice. It's making me really nervous. Just ahead, her message about always trusting your gut that's hitting home with millions. And shell of a day. We'll take you inside the efforts to save baby sea turtles hitting the high seas for a special turtle release live today, Thursday, September 22nd, 2022. From NBC News, this is Today with Savannah Guthrie and Hoda Kotb, live from Studio 1A in Rockefeller Plaza. Hi, good Thursday morning. Happy you're joining us today. And it's always nice to start a Thursday off with an, oh, I was going to say, we've got a cuteness alert yeah. here. Mm -hmm. Not just Carrie Sanders, but the baby <laughs> turtle he holds in his hand. And in a yeah. few, we're going to see those baby turtles released. Oh, right inside? Yes. It's oh. a great story. Warm your heart. Oof. Also an important story about our changing climate as well. Indeed. Also ahead, guys, uh, with so many ups and downs in the economy lately, we're going to simplify what that latest interest rate hike will mean for you, from your grocery bills to the gas bills to credit card rates, all of it, how it affects your bottom line. That's right. But first, new details this morning surrounding former President Trump's growing legal problems from a key ruling on those classified documents seized from his Florida country club to a new high-profile civil suit, a lawsuit filed by New York's attorney general. And overnight, Mr. Trump firing back in a new interview. NBC's chief White House correspondent, Kristen Walker, on the story this morning. Kristen, good morning. Hi, Savannah and Hoda. Good morning to both of you. A three-judge panel, including two judges appointed by former President Trump, handing a victory at least temporarily to the Justice Department. It comes just hours after New York's attorney general announced a $250 million civil suit against Mr. Trump and his adult children, accusing them of widespread business fraud. Overnight, the president defiant, blasting the allegations as politically motivated. This morning, a new legal setback for former President Trump, a federal appeals court unanimously ruling the Justice Department can resume reviewing classified documents seized from Mar-a-Lago as part of its criminal probe, reversing a ruling by a federal judge. It's a very unfair situation. In a Fox News interview recorded before the decision, Mr. Trump's most extensive comments yet about the search at Mar-a-Lago, in which FBI investigators seized more than 11,000 government documents, including including dozens marked classified. Mr. Trump insisted he had declassified everything. If you're the president of the United States, you can declassify just by saying um, it's declassified, even by thinking about it. The appeals court noted Mr. Trump had not presented any evidence he had declassified records. For the first time, Mr. Trump also saying without evidence that other personal items were taken. I think they took my will. I found out yesterday. I said, where is it? It's one of a number of ongoing investigations swirling around the former president from election and January 6th investigation probes to a criminal investigation in New York and a civil case there where Mr. Trump received his second legal blow in a matter of hours yesterday. Earlier, New York's Attorney General Letitia James announced she was suing Mr. Trump, accusing him and his children, Don Jr., Eric and Ivanka, of a scheme to falsely inflate the value of assets, like, she says, declaring a New York property was $524 million, even though an appraiser valued it at just $200 million, all to obtain favorable loans and better tax rates. It's the art of the steal. The lawsuit seeks $250 million in damages and a ban permanently blocking the Trumps from running businesses in New York. Mr. Trump calling it a politically motivated witch hunt. Well, she campaigned on it four years ago. She just talked about Trump and we're going to indict him. We're going to get him. That's an apparent reference to this video posted by Eric Trump, showing James vowing to sue Mr. Trump even before she was elected. Oh, we're going to definitely sue him. We're going to be a real pain in the 
And in that interview with Fox News, Mr. Trump also repeated the claim the FBI may have planted evidence during the Mar-a-Lago search. The FBI and Justice Department have not commented on his accusations. New York's Attorney General sent a criminal referral to U.S. prosecutors and the IRS, meaning all of this could potentially lead to criminal charges. It is worth noting most civil cases are settled outside of court, Savannah and Hoda. So that's the legal setting. What about the political setting? Because the former president has indicated he wants to run again. Mm -hmm. Does any of this impact that? Well, uh, let's talk legally and politically. His allies have argued to the former president that a potential run could shield him from future charges. Now, that's not exactly the case. DOJ does have a policy of not interfering in elections, meaning they typically wouldn't bring charges within months of an election. And there's also a federal policy that a sitting president cannot be indicted. But that's to say nothing of state charges. Politically speaking, I've been speaking to some of his allies who say the former president's actually feeling emboldened by these cases swirling around him, feels as though it may galvanize some of his supporters. So it is still very much an open question that we watch closely. All right, Kristen, thank you very much. Also this morning, there is mounting fallout and tension over an escalating war of words between President Biden and Russia's Vladimir Putin. Mr. Biden delivering a harsh rebuke against the Russian leader's nuclear threats and his effort to mobilize more forces in the war in Ukraine. NBC's chief foreign correspondent Richard Engel is in northern Ukraine near the Russian border with the very latest there. Hey, Richard, good morning. Good morning, Hoda. I can tell from here that Ukrainians are completely undeterred by Vladimir Putin's nuclear threats, by his moves to call up hundreds of thousands of more soldiers. The Ukrainians have been making major battlefield advances and in some places have pushed right up to the Russian border. This town where I am uh, right now is only about two miles from the Russian border. Russian troops were in charge here until they were recently driven out by the Ukrainians. And Ukrainians we've been speaking to here say this is no time to slow down. They believe they have momentum on their side. Facing heavy losses in Ukraine, President Putin announced a partial military mobilization. The Russian president is looking for 300,000 reserve troops to fight his war. But instead, Russians are mobilizing on the streets of Moscow, chanting, send Putin to the trenches. Hundreds of demonstrators have been detained for saying, not me. Other Russians are fleeing the country. Flights from Moscow to all visa-free destinations selling out quickly. There are also long lines of cars heading to Finland, which has open borders. Secretary At the UN, President Biden condemned Putin leaders. for making nuclear threats and for supporting a vote in Russian-occupied parts of Ukraine, which Russia could use to justify annexing more Ukrainian territory. President Putin has made overt nuclear threats against Europe. Now. Russia is calling, calling up more soldiers to join the fight. You cannot seize a nation's territory by force. Hours earlier, President Putin, in a rare admission the war isn't going to plan, said he had no choice but to call up more troops because the West is trying to use the war in Ukraine to break Russia apart. Putin threatened to use nuclear weapons to stop that. No one threatened Russia. And no one other than Russia sought conflict. The military mobilization. Russia Russia's tried to block Ukraine's President Zelensky from speaking at the UN. Also true. He received a standing ovation instead. Russia is calling up more troops because it's low on soldiers, according to U.S. and NATO officials. Ukraine claims the war has cost Russia more than 50,000 soldiers so far, about a third of the force it had when it invaded last winter. Russia admits to far fewer losses. Ukrainian officials believe it will take several months, maybe even six months, for Russia to recruit all of the reservists, get them equipped, get them ready for battle. And they believe that gives the Ukrainian army a window to keep its offensive going and to drive potentially 
even closer to the Russian border. Hoda? All right, Richard Angle for us there at the border. Richard, thank you. We turn to the economy now. Mm -hmm. Craig joins us. Good morning. Hey, Craig. Savannah, Hoda, good morning. Good morning to you as well. Let's turn to the newest push to control those soaring inflation and sky-high consumer prices. The Federal Reserve announcing it is again raising interest rates this time by three quarters of a point so what does it all mean for your bottom line we're going to talk about that with steph rule in just a moment but first nbc's emily akeda has the story emily good morning to you and good morning to you from housing to grocery bills inflation has hammered americans from all angles so the federal reserve is trying to rein in runaway prices with these repeated interest rate hikes but the fed chairman warning this week things may get worse before they get better this morning, the Federal Reserve continuing its campaign to curb inflation, raising its benchmark interest rate for the fifth time this year and signaling there's more to come. We have got to get inflation behind us. I wish there were a painless way to do that. There isn't. The central bank boosting rates three quarters of a percentage point, with Americans already facing price hikes on nearly everything. Even nearly 100 days of declining gas prices has come to an end, with the national average ticking up to $3.68 Wednesday. The Fed's latest move makes borrowing money more expensive, influencing car payments, business loans, credit card debt, and mortgage rates which have now reached 6.25%, their highest level in 14 years, according to Mortgage Bankers Association. Experts say that's all by design. They want to slow consumer demand down, so you'll buy less and prices will come down. Let me open that one for you. Anika Hobbs owns Nubian Human, a boutique in Washington, D.C., and says interest rate increases are slowing her plans to expand. What does a steep interest rate hike mean for your business right now? It's really, really causing a deeper hole for those businesses that are already, um, you know, working on very slim margins and very small staff. The Fed is walking a fine line, trying to tamp down inflation without pushing the economy into a recession. While the unemployment rate is strong now, the Fed chairman anticipates hundreds of thousands of additional Americans could be jobless next year. So interest rate hikes, they are not a quick fix. And again, the Fed signaled more significant increases lie ahead. But there is one silver lining for savers. That jump in interest also means a boost in some rates on savings accounts. People with money in online high yield savings accounts could see interest as high as two and a half percent. So something worth looking into. Hoda. All right, Emily, thank you. We're going to turn now to the expertise of NBC senior business correspondent, Stephanie. I like saying expertise, by the way, Steph. Uh, this is the pressure on me. <laughs> yeah, exactly. Yeah. The Fed seems to keep raising interest rates. And the question is, is it working? Is there any proof that this plan is actually the right plan to be on? Well, they don't have another plan, right? The only thing the Fed can do is raise rates to lower inflation. And it's not that it's not working, but it's certainly not working fast enough. It's not working as quickly as we thought it would. Prices aren't continuing to get higher and higher. It's slowing, but they're not going down. Mm -hmm. And so as much as we don't like dealing with higher interest rates, what's even worse is when everything is just super expensive. And that's the top priority for Jay Powell, the Fed chair. Mm -hmm. So what's he going to do? Keep raising rates to try to take this on. But he's threading this needle because if he does it too hard, too fast, the economy goes into mm -hmm. recession. So Listen. how do you ward that off? And Wall Street clearly didn't like this yesterday. Mm -hmm. That's the really tricky thing, right? He has to thread this needle because when you raise rates, what happens? It makes everything more expensive to borrow, not just for you and me, our mortgages, our car loans, mm -hmm. but for businesses. Businesses operate by borrowing. Many of them borrow to make payroll. So when you say, oh, is this going to tip us into a recession? Well, if everything is more expensive, if businesses are struggling to operate, then they could start laying people off. And Jay Powell did warn us of that yesterday. He said, expect I could be raising rates and we might see an uptick in unemployment. Mm -hmm. And while nobody likes that, we do have a little bit of cushion because the labor markets are so strong. There are so many jobs out there. We've got some cushion, but it's not a great picture. Mm -hmm. All right. It's tricky business. Yeah, it is. Tricky Steph, business. We're happy that you're here. Thanks, Steph. Great so, to be here. Mm -hmm. We've got some more breaking news overnight as well. A powerful 6.8 magnitude earthquake struck Mexico, killing at least two people. The epicenter was about 30 miles south of Agalia, but it could be felt hundreds of miles away in Mexico City. That's where people rushed out into the streets in the middle of the night there. Officials say a woman died after falling down the stairs in her house. It all comes just three days after another deadly quake 
about 200 miles away on the Pacific coast. And Hurricane Fiona remains a powerful Category 4 storm as it heads west of Bermuda now. And in the meantime, more than a million people are waking up in Puerto Rico and the Dominican Republic without power again this morning. Making matters worse, Puerto Rico is now under a heat advisory. Mm. Temperatures expected to soar on parts of the island, which brings us to Al, who's mm -hmm. tracking all of it for us. Good morning. Tough times for our friends down there. It really is, and not going to be getting much better. You can see we got one system that's about to come off the Africa coast. That's good. got a pretty good chance of formation. Same as this in the, the Leeward Islands. But we are watching Fiona and that other system down the Gulf. We'll get to that in a second. Right now, hurricane warnings up for Bermuda, Category 4 storm, a 485 miles southwest of Bermuda with 130 mile per hour winds moving to the northeast at 13 miles per hour. It looks like by Friday morning, it's going to be the storm center about 105 miles west northwest of Bermuda, two to four inches of rain, wind gusts of up to 75 miles per hour or more. Impacts along the east coast, we could have very rough surf right through Friday into Saturday as this makes landfall into Canada. Could be uh, one of the strongest four uh, of, uh, hurricanes that have landed along Canada that are two or higher. Here's what we're watching this next one. 98L it comes and it looks like it will develop 90% of a chance becoming a tropical depression in the next few days. The computer models, this suite of models takes them anywhere from Cancun to Miami. We look ahead to Thursday. We right now low confidence because these haven't formed yet but you can see the American model somewhere at landfall between Galveston and New Orleans. The European model along the Florida coast. We'll just have to continue to track it but this is all the way till next Sunday. So Still a lot of time to see things change. We'll meet Ukrainians who are defending their country one block at a time. When you were still in Kiev, could you hear the bombing? My name is Lester. Man, is this? For breaking news in our changing world, download the NBC News app. These days, it feels like the news never stops. So let's get into it. What's happening right now, what it all means for you for an hour every day. It can be hard to keep up, so let's get started together. Allie Jackson Now, weekdays at 5 on NBC News Now. NBC News, streaming free now. Top Story with Tom Yamas, weeknights at 7 on NBC News Now. Now Tonight with Joshua Johnson, streaming weeknights at 8 on NBC News Now. NBC News, streaming free now. Good morning, welcome to today. I love mornings. They're full of possibility. And how you start your day sets the tone for the whole day. We need to pull up one extra chair at the table. We feel like we're right there with you. Because every day we start our morning so you can take on yours. When was the last time you made space to listen to somebody? What I learned from a very young age is radical love, radical forgiveness. We are meeting people one after the next who have made profound changes. It showed a lot of personal strength for me. Why am I trying to make other people happy over myself? So many life lessons that are going on in these conversations. We're watching a transformation. Join Hoda Kotb for her podcast, Making Space. Listen now. is your latest weather guys all right al thank you uh, coming up the alarming video of a woman who just had a gut feeling on her morning run that was resonating with a lot of people who watched it on TikTok. Ann Thompson had the chance to speak to her. Hey, Annie. Hey, Hoda. This video will send chills up your spine. This Idaho woman's quick thinking then and smart thinking now has got people talking. I'll have her story coming up. Trust your gut is the mm -hmm. lesson there. Then, guys, the challenges of so-called boomerang kids, adult children moving back home with the parents. We saw that happen during the pandemic. Well, it's happening again in this tough economy, so we'll have tips to help everyone cope. <laughs> but first, this is Today on NBC. News is happening now. To look at what's making headlines around the world. We're coming on the air with breaking news. This is a significant moment. Whenever it happens, wherever you are, NBC News, streaming free now. 
Allie Jackson now. Weekdays at 5 on NBC News Now. News is happening now. A look at what's making headlines around the world. We're coming on the air with breaking news. This is a significant moment. Whenever it happens, wherever you are, NBC News, streaming free now. Live from Ukraine, from Uvalde, Texas, from Mayfield, Kentucky. To cover the news, you have to be in it. This is how so many towns and cities are protecting themselves. You can actually see they're pushing the gates open. Was there a school officer on campus? That's what we've been told. No, do you remember any tornado as bad as this one? You look at this and you're thinking, we're not going to have power for weeks, if not months. Exactly. Every night, it's your news playlist. Top Story with Tom Yamas. Weeknights at 7 on NBC News Now. Today is now a podcast, available every morning. Listen wherever you get your podcasts. For breaking news in our changing world, download the NBC News app. Ooh, the answer's calling you. Need them most. Ooh, let it go. The Today Show's newest fan. This is the moment. Little Al Roker. What are you doing here? What am I doing here? You get one beautiful life to live. What are you going to do? This show is so fun, but having you as a positive force means really the world to me. Jenna doesn't stop till it's sold, okay? We have this circle of women that love each other. I decided I'm going to go with the rhythm of life. And you love riding the way. This is a moment we're in right now. This is really electric. Uh, yeah, I love you too. <laughs> Still ahead, a new adventure on the high seas mm. with Carrie Sanders. He's off the coast of Florida right now, getting set for a very special sea turtle release. We are going to bring it to you live after your local news and weather. These days, it feels like the news never stops. So let's get into it. What's happening right now, what it all means for you for an hour every day. It can be hard to keep up, so let's get started together. Allie Jackson now, weekdays at 5 on NBC News Now. These days, it feels like the news never stops. So let's get into it. What's happening right now, what it all means for you for an hour every day. It can be hard to keep up, so let's get started together. Allie Jackson now, weekdays at 5 on NBC News Now. News is happening now. Look at what's making headlines around the world. Right now on Morning News Now. We're coming on the air with breaking news. And this is a significant moment. Whenever it happens, wherever you are, NBC News, streaming free now. That's the royal song. You know what that means. New images of William and Kate just coming in from the UK. The Prince and Princess of Wales stepped out this 